This hearing will come to order. Welcome everyone. As this hearing is fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. And if I notice you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You'll notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I'll begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member and members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit, but in writing, uh, at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. I now recognize myself for five minutes for my opening statement. The subcommittee will come to order. Let us begin our first hearing on the fiscal year 2022 budget request for the Department of Energy. Thank you, Secretary Granholm, for joining us today. I am so thrilled to have a fellow Great Lakes colleague with such a distinguished career as America's new Secretary of Energy. With Secretary Jennifer Granholm, a results-oriented leader, I just know with her vast experience, she will ensure the transition to a clean energy future for our country, and it will be done with workers and communities in mind. As we begin our discussion on fiscal year 2022, I must first note that we appreciate the recently released budget overview, and we look forward to receiving the full budget request, hopefully very soon, to allow us to move forward expeditiously to craft our bill. The Department of Energy addresses our nation's most pressing energy, environmental, and nuclear security challenges through transformational science, technology, and applied system investments across our nation. The Department of Energy funding translates into jobs. And if you look across our country, there are over 7 million Americans now working in the energy sector. The department's funding has helped to drive down the prices of wind, solar, energy storage, and efficient light bulbs by 60 to 90% since, since 2008. But did you know that the Department of Energy is helping to decode DNA through the Human Genome Project? It has developed the fastest computers in the world, and it has discovered 22 new elements of the periodic table. It's busy on many fronts. With new challenges comes opportunity, opportunity to achieve progress for our nation to sustain life, to grow our economy and to assure national security through energy independence, opportunity to meet the imperative addressing our climate crisis by making energy supplies cleaner and more resilient, opportunity to advance high science and yield innovation to heal our nation to meet new horizons in technology and to keep our nation globally competitive. And last but not least, opportunity to cost effectively sustain the nation's nuclear deterrent while simultaneously supporting nuclear non-proliferation. The Biden administration has been clear from day one about the need to urgently address the climate crisis. Extreme weather events are becoming more frequent from the winter energy disaster in Texas to water surpluses in the heartland to the ongoing and worsening drought in the West, our way of life will continue to deteriorate if we don't act and make adjustments to secure a better future. In addition, extreme weather is extremely costly. Last year alone, natural disasters cost the United States nearly $100 billion. The Department of Energy holds a consequential opportunity to meet the needs of a new day. Our nation must lead with upfront investments that will help reduce damaging costs to our way of life. As we discussed at hearings earlier this year, DOE funded research and resulting technologies through path-breaking innovations are already helping address climate change. The cost decreases I mentioned have led to widespread deployment 
consumer savings, more good paying jobs, and more security for our people. The budget is an opportunity to invest in our nation and our common future. I welcome the department's leadership in advancing equity by creating an inclusive economy to expand opportunity. I'm pleased to see a serious focus, not only on developing clean energy technologies, but new thinking about how to deploy them. Your focus and leadership will help get us closer, and frankly, your experience as a governor and a successful one will propel the Department of Energy and the nation into this new energy era. The proposed investments in scientific innovations will yield the technologies and jobs of tomorrow and keep the United States as a global leader. And I'm so pleased to see a budget request that proposes more funding for advanced energy in the ARPA-E program and its transformational technologies of the future, rather than eliminating it and burying our nation's potential in ignorance. Current ARPA-E programs are focusing on breakthrough innovations like reducing methane emissions, engineering biology for the future bioeconomy, developing electric power systems for aviation, and even uh, looking at the complex mysteries of the human brain. The budget request also makes a serious investment in one of DOE's most meaningful meet the streets efforts, the weatherization assistance program. It is so pivotal to the mammoth task of energy conservation for existing structures and neighborhoods while helping lower income families and individuals uh, reduce their burdensome energy costs. Finally, I'm excited that the president's American jobs plan creates new jobs by reinvesting in areas and workers too often left behind. Thankfully, it prominently features the department's efforts. The department should be looked at as the jobs department because the Department of Energy produces the new technologies that produce jobs forward in this new energy age. With that, I'll close my remarks. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here today. We look forward to discussing this request and working with the department to serve the needs of our great nation. I'd like to turn to our ranking member, the very able and affable Mr. Simpson for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Kaptur. I'm pleased to join you in welcoming Secretary Granholm to the committee to discuss the fiscal year 2022 budget request for the Department of Energy. Madam Secretary, I understand this is your first hearing since your confirmation. I'm not sure if it will make it easier or harder that we don't have many budget details to ask you about yet. As typically happens in the first year of a new administration, our first look at the budget request is just a high level overview with specific agency details to come later. Based on the information we do have now, though I think there are some proposals that could garner bipartisan support, but there are also some causes for concern. First, I was pleased to see support for research into the important new technologies like advanced nuclear and hydrogen development. Well, I, while I have strong uh, concerns about the impacts of the president's broader climate change policies, it is a fact that advancing any low carbon energy goals must include advanced nuclear. Not only is it a zero emission source, but it is a baseload power that helps ensure reliability of the grid, especially as more intermittent sources like wind and solar are added. We must ensure that the U.S. is a leader in developing advanced nuclear technologies for deployment here at home and around the globe. On the other hand, I was concerned to see not a single mention of cybersecurity in the DOE's budget overview. Over the past year, our nation has experienced a series of high profile cyber attacks, solar winds, Oldsmar, and numerous ransom attacks, uh, ransomware attacks. Cyber threats like these are persistent and increasing. As our world becomes more reliant on internet connected capabilities and technologies, we know that the cybersecurity challenge in front of us will increase in scope. The omission of cybersecurity in the budget over, uh, overview suggests it is not sufficiently prioritized by the administration. I was similarly concerned to see that the National Nuclear Security Administ Administration gets short shift in the budget overview. The NNSA's programs are critical to our national security and constituted almost half of the department's budget last year. Yet the budget overview devotes only two sentences to these programs. Unfortunately, the NNSA is simply one example of the lack of priority for national security in this year's president's budget requests. The increase for non-defense programs is almost nine percent, the in, or nine times the increase of defense programs. Using the administration's own numbers, non-defense programs are increased by 105 billion or 16 percent, while defense programs only go up by 12 billion, or not even two percent. 
That amount doesn't even keep up with inflation. While I am not opposed to reasonable increases for some non-defense priorities, it is foolish to pretend, pretend that there are not equally or more pressing national security needs. This year's budget process is further complicated by the fact that we do not have an agreement in place on overall budget caps. We have a lot of work to do ahead of us and get to our appropriation bills done. Not all of it is within the control of this committee. Secretary Granholm, I appreciate uh, your being here today to shed uh, as much light as you can on the DOE's budget request. I know my colleagues and I look forward to working with you to move forward a budget that will strengthen our national security and advance our energy independence. I thank Chairwoman Capture for holding this hearing and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Simpson, very much. Uh, and let me say we are extremely grateful this morning or this afternoon that full committee chair DeLauro has joined us for this critical topic. And I will now turn to Chair DeLauro for her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chairwoman Captor, Ranking Member Simpson, uh, for holding uh, today's hearing. Uh, let me welcome uh, uh, Secretary Granholm, and I might add just the second woman uh, ever to lead the Department of Energy, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, as Governor of Michigan, you successfully led efforts to prioritize clean energy in the state, and now one-third of all North American electric vehicle battery product production takes place in Michigan. So your track record along with your depth of knowledge and dedication to our environment makes you a strong leader in this role. Uh, today, I look forward to your testimony on the administration's discretionary budget request for the Department of Energy and its critical work in addressing the energy and environmental challenges that face our nation. How we move forward with our energy initiatives will impact future generations. And it is our responsibility to take care of this planet that we call home. Uh, the threat that is global climate change impacts every aspect of life as we know it. For our economic, national, and environmental security, we need to shift away from fossil fuels and diversify with investments in the next generation of clean and renewable energy technologies. With President Biden's funding request for the Department of Energy, we are taking steps to provide a better, safer, and cleaner future for all Americans. The 10.2% increase in the budget for the department reflects much needed advancements for clean energy jobs, community investments, and the safety and the security of our nuclear stockpile. The numbers do not lie. Investing in clean energy creates jobs and strengthens our economy. In my home state of Connecticut, a $1.2 billion investment in our clean energy economy generated over $75 million in tax revenues prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, there were more than 44,000 clean energy workers, 44,000 uh, clean energy workers employed in over 4,300 companies with Connecticut's $6.5 billion clean energy economy. And once we recover from the impacts of COVID-19, those numbers are expected to grow. President Biden has stressed the importance of creating jobs for the American people. Clean energy initiatives is one of the first steps to achieve that goal. Funding would be used for building clean energy projects, workforce initiatives to cut carbon pollution while creating good paying jobs. And by investing $8 billion into new technologies, such as advanced nuclear energy technologies, electric vehicle, vehicles, green hydro hydrogen, the, the president's budget request will transform American power and help move our nation's economy into the 21st century. In addition, the budget request prioritize, uh, uh, prioritizes funding for historically black colleges and universities, minority serving institutions, cleanup efforts at World War II and Cold War nuclear sites, and the recapitalization of the National Nuclear Security Administration's infrastructure and facilities. This will also support transformative solutions for carbon-free energy, adaptation, and climate resist resilience. As this committee puts together the appropriations bill for the next year, supporting the Department of Energy will be crucial in achieving these goals. And with that, I wanna say thank you to Chairwoman Kaptur and Ranking Member Simpson, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, your appearing this morning, this afternoon, uh, despite your extremely busy schedule, and uh, we welcome your recommendations. Thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, 
We are uh, very excited today, as you know, to welcome Secretary Granholm, uh, who is joining us today and, and uh, wait for her observations of how the Department of Energy can confront the climate crisis while creating more and better jobs. Following a bipartisan confirmation vote, Secretary Granholm <clears throat> became just the second woman, as you've mentioned, to lead the Department of Energy. And previously, Secretary Granholm was the first woman elected governor of Michigan, serving two terms from 2003 to 2011. What a consequential period to have served as governor of Michigan as America endured that great recession and this part of America uh, battered. As governor, Jennifer Granholm faced economic downturns caused by the Great Recession and meltdown in the automotive and manufacturing sectors. She successfully led uh, efforts to diversify the state's economy, strengthen its auto industry, preserve the manufacturing sector to some level, and add emerging sectors such as clean energy to Michigan's economic portfolio. She understands what it's like to live in parts of our country that were harmed so greatly. With that amazing experience, I look forward to her leadership at the Department of Energy to apply those lessons across the United States. She truly understands the importance of American workers and communities at risk of being left behind. And I'm excited to work closely with her to, as she puts it, kickstart America's clean energy revolution, create millions of good paying union jobs and deliver benefits to America's workers and communities across the nation. Thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. Without objection, your written statement will be entered into the record. Please feel free to summarize your remarks, Secretary Granholm. Chairwoman Kaptur, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, Chairwoman DeLauro, so great to see you here. Ranking Member Simpson, and certainly members of the subcommittee, it is an honor to appear before you today to discuss uh, the President's 2022 discretionary request for the Department of Energy. Uh, it is a privilege to serve as the 16th Secretary of Energy and lead the department in delivering technological advancements and scientific discoveries and advancing the energy, economic, and, and national security of the United States. I'm really proud to say that we've accomplished a lot since January 20th. We've been focusing on our core missions around uh, science and security. Our 17 national labs continue to make groundbreaking discoveries, including in the fight against COVID-19. Our teams at CSER and the NNSA remain steadfast in safeguarding the electrical grid and our nuclear stockpile. And beyond that, we've jump-started efforts to build a clean energy economy that, as you have all noted, creates millions of good-paying jobs and lifts American families in every pocket of the country into the middle class. We declared that America is back at the international table for climate action. We announced over a billion dollars in grants and awards and funding opportunities for clean energy R&D projects that'll help us achieve a net zero carbon future. We've set ambitious new goals to cut solar costs by more than half and add 30 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2030, the latter of which is gonna support 77,000 jobs and power 10 million homes while cutting 78 million metric tons of carbon emissions. We created a new Office of Energy Jobs to ensure that the projects we support offer the highest possible potential for job creation. We made commitments to direct 40% of the benefits from clean energy investments into communities on the front lines of climate change and on the front lines of the energy transition. And already we're following through on that commitment with investments in geothermal energy, in carbon capture, in critical mineral extraction that are, that are all gonna create jobs in coal communities. And these are just the starting points in our effort to own the global market for clean energy and sustainable technologies. That market is going to reach $23 trillion at least by the end of the decade. So you better believe we are going to capture some of that market with the right strategies and we are in the game. But as our economic competitors race ahead, we have to put a lot more resources behind this effort because they see that $23 trillion market and they are going after it as well. 
So in March, the president um, released the American Jobs Plan, which is, of course, a once in a generation investment in our nation's economic competitiveness through through infrastructure, through R&D, through manufacturing. And of course, infrastructure is what keeps our economy operating effectively. And it's not just roads and bridges. It's not just ports and airports. It's not just trains. But it is the electrical grid that keeps the lights on and the pipes that pump water into the buildings and the broadband that brings the world to our children and opportunity to our businesses. We have to also jolt our commitments to R&D so that it's American researchers making the breakthroughs that drive clean energy and our future and American entrepreneurs taking those breakthroughs to scale. And, and by revitalizing our manufacturing backbone, we can build these technologies and products right here at home with American workers. So President Biden's uh, proposed 2022 discretionary funding request would position the entire federal government to help our country stake our claim in this can't miss clean energy opportunity. We invest 46.2 billion in the Department of Energy's key priorities. And those priorities include deploying cheap, abundant, clean power on a modernized, secure, resilient, reliable energy grid and creating all those jobs in the process. The priorities include quadrupling clean energy research over four years to put America at the forefront of clean energy innovation worldwide, advancing carbon reduction and mitigation through technologies like carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, breaking down the barriers to increase diversity in STEM fields, and of course, strengthening the department's nuclear security mission. And we, we are um, committed to all of that. And in conclusion, I'm humbled to reaffirm my commitment to lead the Department of Energy. I look forward to our continued partnership to achieve these goals. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Secretary Granholm, very much for your statement and uh, for helping our country. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You'll notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time has almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order as we did in our first hearings, beginning with the chair and ranking member, and then members present at the time the hearing is called to order, recognized in order of seniority, and finally members arriving after gavel uh, by order uh, of arrival. Additional rounds of questions may occur after all members have an opportunity for a first round. We will now begin questioning under normal rules. Madam Secretary, I was interested to note that uh, the position of solar installer is now the number one sought after occupation uh, and there are positions that remain unfilled across our country. This is a sea change compared to 10 and even, certainly 20 years ago. Uh, but my question relates to place-based strategies. Different regions have unique opportunities and challenges. So, for example, my northern Ohio heavily industrial region in the manufacturing and automotive belt of the Great Lakes has a robust automotive supply chain, numerous energy intensive industries uh, like steel and refining, a diverse solar industry, expertise in specific R&D processes like advanced manufacturing and access to world class transportation and natural resources. Using a place based approach can seed the future, for instance, in Toledo, my home. A homegrown scientist by the name of Dr. Harold McMaster and his partner, Norm Nitschke, uh, use their American genius and uh, their knowledge in automotive manufacturing techniques to birth what now I'm told is the largest solar company in our nation called First Solar. Uh, that was 30 years ago. And those jobs and that company is delivering today thousands upon thousands of clean energy jobs and cementing our region as a leader of the green energy revolution. As communities respond to challenges relating to climate change and building a clean energy future, can you elaborate on strategies for places like Toledo, Ohio, with a resource rich economy, with major solar manufacturers and high-tech research and development capabilities? How can these places 
capitalize on their local resources to counteract growing regional inequalities? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question, Congresswoman, because I completely agree that we have to target job creation for specific communities. We have to think about what assets a community brings to bear and what natural resources they can draw upon and what their industrial legacy is. And so First Solar probably chose Ohio because of that manufacturing and automotive legacy. And that's unique to Ohio. So what are the other areas of the country? What assets do they have? What's their geography look like? What, what unique thing that can they, is their comparative advantage? And in this energy realm, there are all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people in all pockets of the country because every place in the country is unique. I want this place-based work designed to help make sure that nobody is left behind to be the core of this clean energy deployment strategy, both in this budget and in the American Jobs Plan. It's a, an opportunity to put our depth of human capital to work, but it has to be deliberate. So the president has identified several place-based initiatives, including the coal and power plant communities, communities that have seen industrial jobs disappear and also environmental justice communities that have been disproportionately burdened by generations of, of pollution without always seeing the economic benefits of the energy industry that created the pollution. So these types of tailored approaches to regional job creation are key to getting all of our country to work as we compete for the global clean energy market. It, if, if, if you look at Michigan, because we built car 1.0, we decided we would diversify to build car 2.0. That was a comparative advantage that we had. And so the car 2.0 has the battery and the battery is the guts to that electric vehicle. So this is why we had a strategy around creating that component of this clean energy economy in Michigan. Every one of your states has something that is unique to you that you can create an industrial cluster around. And we wanna focus our efforts to make sure that that happens and that Department of Energy is a partner in, in that effort. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, very much. I think one of the challenges you will have is the Department of Energy itself because it, uh, it does such astounding work, but it has not focused heavily on regions. Uh, it tends to cluster around its, um, they won't agree with this statement, but uh, they tend to uh, focus around their lab region and they have an impact across the country. But what you're saying, it will require muscling up inside the department itself. Uh, it, uh, they do well uh, on so many fronts and they impact our way of life. But I think your focus on place-based strategy is um, a new page for the department, and we obviously want to help you achieve your goals. I will now turn uh, uh, the uh, questioning to uh, our uh, ranking member, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Chair Wynn. Uh Madam Secretary, this committee has heard from numerous experts over the past few years, uh, and I agree that nuclear energy must be a significant part of any plan for achieving low carbon energy goals. To help ensure the United States will be a leader in advanced nuclear technologies, Congress has supported on a bipartisan, bicameral basis uh, multiple near-term demonstration projects through the DOE and other agencies, as well as work on several options for the next round of demonstrations. Many of these efforts will depend on key capabilities located at the Idaho National Laboratory and the Nuclear Reactor Innovation Center housed here, as well as other national laboratories. In addition to building these demonstration projects, we must also continue to support the foundational research into fuels and materials that will help us maintain the current fleet and drive our nuclear innovation in the future. Secretary Granholm, can you please share how the department will balance efforts to pursue demonstration activities to maintain research and development capabilities? Yes, sir. I uh, strongly believe that nuclear energy should play an important role in helping the U.S. meet the, our clean energy goals. We pursue at the department both demonstration and early stage R&D efforts for multiple nuclear technologies based upon where those technologies are in their development and how they're developing relative to the, uh, the field's needs. For example, um, Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Program supports the development of, of multiple innovative U.S.-based design for small 
modular reactors. Uh, that technology has the potential, of course, to provide safe and clean and cost competitive energy generation options for both domestic and international markets. Um, we're seeing promising results with the work of, for example, NuScale, which is the first small modular reactor developer to obtain um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission approval of its final safety evaluation report. And that puts the new scale design on track to receive the full um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission certification by this year, mid to late uh, 2021. So completely agree that we've got to, we've got to double down on our focus on both R&D as well as deployment of nuclear and keeping the fleet uh, that we have. Uh, thank you for that. I agree. Uh, another question, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, this is not the time to take our eye off the ball when it comes to cybersecurity uh, of our nation's critical energy infrastructure. How are you planning to maintain or increase the level of focus on cybersecurity in the department? And as I said in my opening statement, I was disappointed that in the, or maybe even surprised is a better word, uh, in the uh, skinny budget that cybersecurity was not mentioned. Well, it is definitely a focus of ours. Um, so don't let that fool you. I, I do want to say I'm not going to be Pollyanna-ish uh, and tell you that protecting the grid, for example, from cyber threats is easy. It's another reason why it must be a focus. The power grid, as you know, is one of the most complex machines on earth. It's got more than 3,000 independent grid operators controlling portions of it. There are over 55,000 substations, 450 thousand miles of high voltage transmission lines. So, so some of the uh, operators are large and sophisticated companies and they've got robust tools and others are small munis and co-ops with uh, far fewer resources. So the threat, the cyber threat, it is getting more complex and it is becoming more frequent, especially as we continue to electrify everything in our lives. But I can tell you that I am totally focused on this. I know from our industry partners that I've spoken to that they are, are totally focused on it. And I am completely committed to getting them and us the tools and the intelligence and the cyber response that they need to address the threats that are out there. Making CSER um, are an effective organization within um, DOE has been a mission of mine. I'm taking steps now to refocus CSER to, uh, on, on being a, uh, service to the grid operators, uh, providing them with the tools and the intelligence and the cyber um, response capabilities that they need. And I'm also going to be making sure that um, cyber R&D is a focus for all of our technology programs. I mean, the truth is that everything we're working on that will plug in to the power grid is a potential cyber attack vector. And we need to be thinking about all of our R&D through that lens. And the final thing I would just quickly say is that I have um, brought on uh, board a fabulous senior leader for CSER to lead our cybersecurity efforts. His name is Push Kumar, and he comes to us with previous government service. And most recently, he was running the uh, grid cyber efforts for SoCal Edison, so both public and private sector experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. And thank you for staying within the time limit, both you and the secretary. That's pretty Hi. good. Uh, <laughs> Chairwoman DeLauro. The gentlelady will have to unmute. Thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, uh, we can't reach a carbon neutral goal by 2050 with only our technologies of today. So it's about investing, discovering the technologies of tomorrow and accelerating that transition to a clean energy uh, future that wards off the devastation of climate change. Can you d discuss the department's approach for deploying clean energy technologies while also continuing to innovate to develop the clean energy technologies that we will need for the future? Uh, Madam Chair, I could not have said it better myself. We, we've already got the technologies ready to deploy, right, from renewable energy and energy storage to electric vehicles, building electrification. We've already got all of that technology to decarbonize the majority of our economy. Mm -hmm. So the combination of solar power and wind power and battery storage and energy efficiency uh, is already cheaper than fossil fuels in much of the country. But at the same time, we have technologies like 
carbon capture and uh, hydrogen that are absolutely <laughs> essential for the harder to decarbonize fossil fuels in the economy. And they are essential in ensuring uh, a vital economic future, especially for communities in the fossil fuel industry, but aren't yet being widely deployed. So they need demonstration projects and they need continued R&D to keep bringing down the cost so we can take them to scale as well. And at the same time, all across our technology options, continued innovation is absolutely vital. So even as we've brought down the cost of solar power through all these tools, as, uh, as uh, Chairwoman Kaptur was saying, from R&D to demonstration and deployment, we brought down the price to the point that it's growing so rapidly today in solar. We're still doing R&D though on, on materials that will make it even cheaper and better performing. And we're still mm -hmm. innovating on, on soft costs like permitting that will mean our um, cost of installation is, is still higher than in other countries. And we wanna bring that down. We wanna work on how to uh, boost American manufacturing of solar equipment and not let our economic competitors completely take that away. So mm -hmm. as you suggest, Madam Chair, we, we have to do all of the above, essentially. We have to deploy, 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 deploy. the technologies <laughs> that we already have, and we've got to decarbonize as fast as we can to create massive jobs and rein in the climate crisis. And we also have to innovate, innovate, innovate to get the whole economy decarbonized and to bring the benefits mm -hmm. of that zero carbon economy to every community in, in the country. I think you're up to the task, uh, Madam Secretary. But let me, you, you mentioned uh, hydrogen. Um, and I want to get your view as to the potential of hydrogen in a, in a future clean energy economy. How are you working to ensure that the hydrogen programs are coordinated across the department between the Office of Fossil Energy and the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy? Yeah, this is a great, great question because hydrogen does cover a, a wide band, right? So hydrogen has huge potential. <laughs> It's um, versatile as a fuel that will help to decarbonize industrial sectors like um, fuel uh, production. It's a clean way to store energy from renewable sources like, like solar and wind. And that those, of course, uh, it can be used to generate electricity in turbines and in fuel cells. Um, it can be used for transportation. It can be used for industrial applications. Um, clean hydrogen may also play um, a role in fueling trucks and buses and fleets where mm -hmm. electrification hasn't, hasn't um, been so easily mm -hmm. addressed through batteries as it is for smaller vehicles. And because it's got a variety of applications across these sectors, there's, as you suggest, lots of DOE, including uh, mm -hmm. energy efficiency and renewable energy and fossil energy and nuclear energy and the Office of Electricity and the Office of Science and RPE. They're all engaged in this important work. These offices are closely coordinating on this mm -hmm. issue to ensure that their work builds a, a cohesive and holistic approach mm -hmm. to unlocking hydrogen in our path to a zero emissions economy. They all work together, and that is a requirement because this hydrogen economy is going to be necessary in all these vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, th thank you. And I've just about 20 seconds left, so I would submit a, a question for the, uh, for the record uh, that in the budget request, what is the potential for investment in scaling up a clean energy workforce and some of the educational programs and opportunities available uh, to potential clean energy workers? So, you know. We share that. I'm happy to respond. Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't want to go past my time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Chairwoman Deloro, for taking time for our subcommittee, really. Thank you for your work. You're extraordinary. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, now call on, oh, I wanted to make a comment before I call on Congressman Calvert. Uh, the cyber issue, of course, affects the energy industry directly, and I can comment on behalf of private companies that I represent and how their technology is hacked all the time not once a week, not twice a week, hundreds of times a week. And so this cyber issue is in the interests of the nation and it's certainly in the interests of those that are working in the energy realm and in high science. Uh, Congressman Calvert. There we go. You, uh, Madam, can you hear me all right? Now, there you go. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Secretary Granholm, for joining us today. I look forward to working with you to address our nation's most challenging energy and national security challenges. I also serve as the ranking Republican on the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, and I've already discussed my concerns with our military leaders and the administration's proposed reduction in defense spending would prevent us from meeting the goals in our national defense strategy. Uh, as you're aware, the threats from Russia and China are real. We, we will soon face, for the first time in our history, two nuclear-capable peer competitors. Countering these threats and keeping our country safe requires a credible deterrent. Cold War-era weapons infrastructure will not remain credible to our enemies forever. Admiral Chase Richard, who I'm sure you've met with, commander of our U.S. Strategic Command, has said that the nuclear modernization, including in NSA's weapons complex and supporting infrastructure, is a high priority. Uh, Secretary Granholm, do you agree that maintaining a credible nuclear tri uh, triad deterrent is important to our national security? Absolutely. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, DOE and NSA's role in ensuring a credible deterrent is to ensure a safe, secure, and reliable nuclear weapons stockpile. Unfortunately, after the end of the Cold War, we failed to maintain many of the necessary capabilities and infrastructure, such as plutonium pit production. So now we must reestablish those capabilities. Uh, Secretary uh, Granholm, do you support NNSA's pit production activities? More specifically, do you support the goal of producing 80 pits uh, per year through the two-site solution? I do. Good. I'm glad to hear that, too. Uh, one other comment I have also on, uh, I'm going to take go off the, my prepared remark and ask about the broadband for a second. Um, our friend uh, Elon Musk, as you know, is uh, uh, putting up uh, what he calls a space net uh, and uh, is actively putting up satellites, as you're probably aware, uh, and uh, believes he'll be able to supply broadband through the whole world in a relatively short period of time. Um, why don't we uh, play off the private sector rather than having to invest a significant amount of money uh, in broadband if the private sector is doing that right now? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, I, I don't know 100% whether that broadband uh, effort by Elon Musk will reach the last mile communities in rural areas that have been have been left behind. We just don't know, right? I mean, he's certainly a capable person, but I, I agree that the public-private partnerships are important, but I also think it is imperative for all these communities uh, to be able to access the internet, the high, high speed, especially, so that we can have businesses and uh, education and, and human beings evolve so that their communities are not left behind. So it's right. you might, you might want to uh, check with him because he claims it does. I mean, he, that he'll touch every corner on the planet, including the well, depths of great. Africa. That's so great. Let's see. We'll that see. Would save us, that would save us a significant amount of money. Real, real quick question on advanced nuclear reactors. Uh, later this afternoon, I'm going to discuss the importance of commercializing uh, micro reactors in our national defense advanced nuclear weapons alliance deterrence center the department has a significant role as you know in helping develop this technology and has the potential to provide clean base load power as the chairman or the ranking member uh, mentioned earlier uh, on the micro uh, reactor uh, set are what are your goals for advancing micro reactor research and development yeah, as yeah. I was uh, mentioning a little bit earlier, the advanced nuclear reactors, the research that's being done, as well as accelerating the deployment of them in a safe and responsible way is super important. It's one of the top priorities for our Office of Nuclear Energy. They have been uh, doing research for both reactors and fuels to support these advanced nuclear technologies. I think in fiscal year 2020, Congress uh, refocused the resources on an actual demonstration of those real reactors that you were mentioning. So, so uh, supportive uh, and we'll continue to prioritize that because it also helps to meet our clean energy uh, goals for both 2035 and 2050. And one quick shout out for uh, fusion. As you know, we have uh, committed hundreds of billions of dollars over the years uh, to fusion research. Uh, and it's always the elusive goal, but it's, it's the one that 
is the magic, the magic one that solves all the problems. So I would hope that we continue to invest in ITER and that the, the department uh, con con continues to have uh, robust support of the fusion programs. Yeah, you, yeah. you will have robust support here. I think it is the holy grail if we can uh, get there. The fusion energy sciences program within our office of science is building the foundations needed to uh, to in, to develop that fusion energy source and the FY22 budget request invests in in that transformative R&D uh, to accelerate progress toward the the fusion future, including investments in uh, additive manufacturing and and quantum and artificial intelligence. And so we're we're excited to be able to support that and hope for uh, the Eater project to come to. <laughs> to be completed within our lifetimes. <laughs> right. Well, I thank you, and uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to uh, just mention before I move to uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz that uh, this subcommittee has a great interest in nuclear fuels and what we can do for storage um, long term. Uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair and Madam Secretary. It's good to see you. Uh, congratulations, and really, the, uh, the future of our, our, our country uh, is in good hands with you in the role that you're in. It was well, well, well chosen. Um, I want to build on, uh, on a topic that the Chairwoman Deloro mentioned, and that is carbon capture. Um, lately, I've been concerned by the fact that some of my colleagues have been advocating against funding decarbonization tools like carbon capture and storage and direct air capture. Most mainstream climate scientists and environmental NGOs agree that we need to use every tool in the toolbox to keep warming below one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And so I, I was encouraged to see that the overview of the president's FY22 discretionary request includes funding to, and I quote, advanced carbon reduction and mitigation in sectors and applications that are difficult to decarbonize, including the industrial sector with technologies and methods such as carbon capture and storage hydrogen and direct air capture, all while ensuring that overburdened communities are protected from increases in cumulative pollution. The bottom line is we gotta get there. We gotta hit the goals. So what is the administration's view on utilizing tools like CCUS to capture carbon before it enters the atmosphere or direct air caption, capture, which would remove carbon that's already in the atmosphere? Yeah, thousand percent. <laughs> this is a critical piece of our techno suite of technology tools to be able to get to that goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And as uh, you know, I'm sure the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that we cannot get there as a globe without this particular technology. So, and building out that technology involves uh, industrial jobs and pipeline jobs. It's a huge jobs opportunity, particularly in the communities that have been left behind in coal communities, for example, that have produced the fuels uh, that power our economy, you know, this is, uh, it's an opportunity for them. So we think that leading uh, the world in this technology, or at least taking this to scale, helping to bring down the cost, sharing that technology with our international partners, it's going to give our industries a competitive edge as the world you know, turns to these low and zero carbon production uh, techniques. And we're looking to make this a major focus of our reorganized um, fossil and uh, fossil energy and carbon management office in the department. We have uh, created, you know, we have had an office of fossil energy. We have added the, the name carbon management because this carbon capture use and sequestration will be an important aspect of what they are, are focused on. Um, and I just want to say, you know, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, carbon capture technology does often refer to capturing carbon at the point where it's emit emitted. Just a word about direct air capture that you talked about. I mean, the technologies for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere when it's already been emitted, that is part of the R&D focus of the fossil energy office. And of course, uh, it's what 
trees and plants do. And that's why these nature-based solutions are one part of it. But we also need, we're doing the research and development on the technology side that can speed up that uh, carbon dioxide removal. So excited to be able to um, know about your support for that. And, uh, and, and as we all know, there is a big uh, chunk of the American Jobs Plan too that has demonstration projects in carbon capture use and sequestration as well as hydrogen, which are super important for these pockets of the country that um, have powered our econ economy through fossil fuels. For my, thank you very much. And for my last minute, I'll just ask my questions together. I, I want to just have you answer on the record. Are you at all worried that tools like CCUS or direct air capture will create an incentive to keep dirty fossil fuel fired plants open for longer? And then let me just ask you a quick Florida based question. Uh, you know, I, I share this the Biden administration's support for a whole of government approach to climate change. We're increasing, increasingly vulnerable in Florida to those impacts uh, and, and agriculture it is really hugely a part of those impacts uh, and important to my state. How can DOE work in the agriculture space to help agricultural producers reduce emissions? And can DOE work with USDA to advance science in this space? That, that's my two questions, if you can. You know, two questions in 20 seconds. On the uh, working with USDA, yes, um, uh, Secretary Vilsack and I have already been on conversations about this. This is a key part of this joint effort between DO, uh, Department of Agriculture and uh, DOE. And with respect to uh, CCUS incentivizing the prolonging of use of fossil fuels, no, the market has already made decisions about that. The globe has made decisions. This allows us to remove um, CO2 from fuels that we know will uh, will exist through 2050, but it will allow them to be clean. And that's what everybody's looking for. So we need, we need both renewables and carbon management strategies in order to get to our goals. Thank you so much for your pragmatic, right. Madam Chair. I yield back the balance of my time that I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz. Congressman Fleischman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Madam Secretary. I'm Chuck Fleischman, and, and I am privileged to represent the people of the Third District of Tennessee, uh, specifically the great city of Oak Ridge, where we have a great national lab, the Y12 plant. We're building the uranium processing facility, and perhaps what I'm even most proud is our legacy cleanup, which we do there and across the country. Uh, excuse the wordiness of this first question, but it's very important, and it will only require a yes or no answer, and I hope I get my second question in. Um, Madam Secretary, I'd like to talk about an important mission that without which we could not have cancer treatments, uh, medical diagnostic techniques, NASA wouldn't be able to explore Mars. That mission, Madam Secretary, is the production of isotopes. Isotopes are used for hundreds of applications, uh, neutron detectors for homeland security applications, explosive de detection, and many others. Uh, this work is done um, under the Office of Science Isotope Production Program. It's also done at several laboratories and universities, including the Oak Ridge National Lab in my district. Many of the critical isotopes for these missions can only be made in Oak Ridge's high flux isotope reactor, also known as HIFER, which has the highest neutron flux available for isotope production in the United States and the nuclear infrastructure, including hot cells, to process the materials after they go into the reactor. It is vitally important that we fund HIFER and those hot cells adequately to make sure that we continue to supply the nation with the isotopes it needs. Over the last few years, the budget request for the hot cells has been inadequate. I've had to work through this committee to ensure the funding was adequate to keep those facilities operating. And I'd like to specifically thank Chairwoman Kaptur for her support in that effort. My question for you, Madam Secretary, is will you ensure that we will have adequate funding uh, to make sure that we can continue to do the important work to deliver these needed isotopes? Yes, the budget supports isotopes. Thank you. By the way, I do invite you to Oak Ridge to see our great DOE right. reservation. Completely Ernie, want to go. I'm excited to. Yes. Thank you. Last year, this is very important. My next question. Last year in Oak Ridge, we celebrated Vision 2020, which saw the first successful demolition of the gaseous diffusion plant. That was K25, which at one point in time was the largest building in the world and was even more impressive with the contractor that it was completed under budget 
four years ahead of schedule and save the taxpayers half a billion dollars. One of the critical factors which allowed us for this cleanup was at the East Tennessee Technology Park was having on-site disposal availability. And this is very important. The current on-site disposal facility is expected to be full by approximately 2027 and does not have the capacity to accommodate all the remaining waste from the cleanup at Oak Ridge National Laboratory or the Y-12 National Security Complex. This makes timely regulatory approval and construction of the new planned on-site disposal facility, environmental management disposal facility, crucial for ensuring continued efficient cleanup across the Oak Ridge Reservation and protecting the health and safety of the public and environment from mercury and other hazards. Is the department still committed to pursuing EMDF and requesting adequate funding, ma'am? Yes, yes. EM is planning on this second on-site uh, disposal facility uh, to support the cleanup efforts there. Um, we're going to use the disposal facilities for low-risk uh, materials with higher uh, contaminated watership uh, off-site for safe disposal and on-site uh, disposal of the low-risk material is the approach that um, ensures the timely progress and the significant risk reduction and uh, the environmental benefit as well. So we're working with EPA uh, and the state of, of Tennessee to on the um, on a scientifically um, driven approach on this. And we are committed to designing and constructing and operating and closing the proposed uh, facility in a manner that protects uh, human health and the environment and on time and support it. And Madam Secretary, so that you know, I had the support of the Obama administration and the Trump administration in getting this done. Matter of fact, Secretary Moniz and I worked so well together. It was his first visit to come to Oak Ridge. When you see it, it will clearly show you the great work that DOE has done historically. We've got a national park there now that Republicans and Democrats work together to get done. Again, I look forward to meeting you in person and inviting you uh, to host you in Oak Ridge. Thank you, you're, you're, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Fleischman. Uh, Madam Secretary, I'm also going to send you a request to kind of help me unload uh, the Department of Energy and help us understand in the area of brain research uh, what the department is doing to help us dig deep and understand the workings of the human mind. I understand Argon uh, and its advanced photon source uh, just discovered a certain type of behavior of neurons that impact individuals who have uh, schizophrenia. And um, it's been very hard to get a sense of how the department looks at uh, brain tissue and, um, uh, con and, and the DNA sets that exist across the United States. We think this is a really important area for inquiry. And... Um, uh, but it needs some type of focus, I think. And uh, so you will get a question on that. I'm just alerting you. Uh, all right, now we're going to turn to Congresswoman Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Secretary Granholm, for your uh, testimony today and your appearance before the committee. And congratulations on your confirmation. I look forward to working with you to prioritize solar and clean energy infrastructure and jobs in my home state of Arizona and across the country. As you stated repeatedly in your testimony, we are indeed in a climate crisis and the American Southwest is in the front line of this crisis. We are blessed with abundant renewable resources like sun and wind, but our days are getting warmer and our water gets more and more scarce. I'm grateful to have this conversation with you today because it, because it is crucial that we invest in tackling the climate, climate crisis and Arizona is a great, great, great place to do this. My, my question has to do with our tribes. So we have 22 federally recognized tribes in Arizona and a big portion of the state is tribal land. Tribal communities have borne the brunt of the climate crisis for decades. Secretary, how do you plan to ensure that tribal energy infrastructure and the needs of tribal communities are met as this administration moves to build back better? 
How will you ensure that the tribes have a seat at the table when we talk about a clean energy transition? Great, thank you so much for asking this question. Uh, engaging with tribal nations is so critical to our focus, not just in Arizona, but across the country on, on ensuring that we approach the energy transition um, with we, uh, while we put equity and, and justice uh, front and center. I think the Navajo and the Hopi nations in Arizona are probably right in the middle of this. Uh, and I think they're significantly impacted by the by the changing fortunes of the, the coal industry and also um, moving to establish a leadership role in clean energy development, which is very exciting. We we plan to make full use of the assets that we have at DOE to, to partner with these nations and to empower them to lead in the, in the energy transition. And that includes um, getting going on our, we have this tribal energy loan guarantee program that has been sitting unused for far too long. I'm thrilled that we have Wahalia Johns. Uh, Wahala is on board as the director of the Indian Energy Program. Um, I'm excited to work with these parts of our DOE teams and collaborate on our um, collective desire to, uh, to make sure that we move all communities forward and take advantage of the opportunity of clean energy. I want to mention that the interagency working group on coal communities work that we are uh, leading, that Department of Energy is leading uh, from the uh, executive order that President Biden signed, is, which is focused on smart investment in the economic uh, future, this place-based strategies for communities affected by the coal transition. That particular report fully recognizes the Navajo and the, and the Hopi and many other tribal nations that, that are affected by the shifting economics of the fossil uh, fuel industry. And we, and we want to proactively work with them so the tribes are uh, totally a part and parcel of our place-based and coal community and power plant community strategy. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's complicated because uh, the coal industry provides a lot of jobs. So, so it's sort of a trade-off. You know, we want it. We don't want to lose those jobs. Uh, some for some communities, that that's all there is. Uh, and so, um, but they want to transition into clean energy. And so, you know, it's gonna. We we appreciate your your interest, and we'd love love to work with you going forward on how we make that happen for the best interest of the people who live up there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Kirkpatrick. Uh, Congressman Newhouse. Thank you very much for recognizing me. Uh, also thank Ranking Member Simpson, both of you for holding this important hearing. Uh, Secretary Granholm, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. It's, it's uh, still morning where I am, so, but uh, I wanna congratulate you as others have on your confirmation as well. As you probably know, at least I hope you do, uh, my district contains the Hanford site, yes. uh, which is our nation's, yeah. Yeah, yes, good. Um, it's our nation's largest cleanup effort, and, and no one is more impacted by this cleanup than the surrounding communities of what we call the Tri-Cities. And, and certainly no one is more invested in its safe and expeditious cleanup than these communities and I would say the men and women who make up the world-class workforce at this site. Um, as you know, at least I, I hope you recall, I sent you a letter in March in inviting you to tour the Hanford site and learn more about the cleanup firsthand. Uh, as I wrote, <clears throat> I, can't, I really can't fully express my disappointment in what I would call unprofessional and, in, uh, and unprecedented in the letter sent to you by our state's attorney general and the state director of ecology, uh, just mere hours after your confirmation vote. In that letter, um, and mind you that the state has a formal regulatory role at Hanford, um, but these state, state leaders signed their names alongside multiple special interest groups uh, outside the Tri-Cities area. And uh, frankly, I'm embarrassed that this was your first interaction on behalf of our state, especially when there is so much we should be working uh, to partner on. And I, I can't begin to tell you the harm it causes 
when state officials defer to special interests over the voices and concerns of local communities who are directly impacted. At the heart of the letter, though, is a rule that began being developed during the Obama administration, and it was finalized by the Trump administration to let science dictate our cleanup actions and the classification of wastes at sites like Hanford. It must be uh, stated for the record that there is overwhelming consensus in the scientific communities, both domestically as well as internationally, that a risk-based approach to nuclear waste management basing decisions on the actual radiological characteristics of the waste rather than where it was originated is the safest approach for this important work. And contrary to what you may have heard from the state, this has nothing to do and should have nothing to do with politics. Even our local newspaper's editorial board stated, and I quote, what's Trump got to do with nuclear waste? Nothing, so don't go there, and I, end quote. Uh, we cannot and should not be bringing politics into these serious decisions, and yet that uh, seems to be what, what is happening. There are many, many challenges facing the Hanford sites. There's still so much work that needs to be accomplished. And it requires a good faith effort from all parties to overcome these challenges and develop comprehensive solutions. So to have this letter sent as at the start of our relationship, I, I believe achieves nothing more than create a contentious distraction. And so I thank you for your patience, I truly do. And, and uh, what I would like to ask is if you could speak to your views on a science-based approach for the environmental management mission within the Department of Energy and whether you will commit to take a, uh, to taking a science-based approach for decision-making at sites like Hanford. And, and Madam Secretary, let me just add, when, when we do have the pleasure of you coming out to tour Hanford, I hope we can also have your commitment to meet with the mayors and the community leaders in the Tri-Cities area to ensure their voices are heard by the federal government. So, I look forward yes. to your response. Thank you so much, uh, Congressman. First of all, thank you for your outreach and uh, your leadership on this. Um, clearly, the we, this administration, certainly DOE, is a believer in science. That's what our department does, and we believe that that's important. I do recognize that there is uh, some friction and controversy, and I think the most important thing to realize about the environmental management effort at DOE is that we really do want to work with communities and make sure that things are done based on science and in a way that's acceptable uh, to communities and bring people along with us. So I very much look forward to meeting with you and the mayors and community leaders and whoever you think um, should be invited so that I can hear and see and experience uh, firsthand what you have been dealing with at Hanford and how we can make sure that the progress that has been made uh, continues apace. So I look forward to working with you on that. And as far as the science-based approach, could you comment yes. on that as well? Yeah, no, no, I, yeah. I, I, I'm reaffirming that we believe in a science-based approach, of course. The gentleman's time has expired. Much. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Congressman Newhouse. Uh, and I believe that Congresswoman uh, Barbara Lee is, uh, Chairwoman Lee is uh, next up. Might be Susie Lee. Oh, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. I thought right. someone had left. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. Congresswoman <laughs> Susie Lee. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to step out because we just honored Juliana Urtebe as the National Teacher of the Year. Uh, she's the first Nevada National Teacher of the Year. So I am in a school uh, <laughs> having just celebrated. So exciting day on Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, but it's really um, a pleasure to have you, Secretary Granholm. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman and Ranking Member, for having this hearing. Uh, we have connected on this issue a few times, and but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, nuclear waste in the Yucca Mountain uh, Nuclear Waste Repository. Uh, Yucca Mountain has been a failure of both policy and science for decades now with millions of dollars wasted and nothing to show for it. So I'm greatly encouraged that this administration has committed to developing an alternative to the use of Yucca Mountain for the storage of nuclear waste. 
Uh, Secretary, could you elaborate on how the administration plans to work with states, tribal governments, and other stakeholders to develop a consent-based siting process for nuclear waste storage? Yes, thank you for, for raising this. I know we have spoken about it, but just for everybody, the department is really actively uh, developing a strategic approach to moving forward with that consent-based um, cited federal interim storage uh, facility, which is what we are authorized to be able to do. We're, we want to use and we will use the $20 million this committee included in the FY 2021 bill to make progress on that interim storage. Um, the possible steps maybe the department might take include uh, requests for information, um, engaging with stakeholders and, and tribal governments, uh, establishing a funding mechanism for interested communities, uh, organizations, maybe tribal governments to explore the concept of uh, consent-based siting of a federal interim uh, storage facility. So we, just so that you know, the department, the Department of Energy hopes to announce the uh, next steps with this process in, in the coming months. Thank you, I look forward to that. And I uh, just wanna give recognition to my colleague, Chuck Fleischman and I are going to co-chair a nuclear waste uh, caucus. And so we hope to be able to work with you on that. Great. Um, I now wanna shift to renewable energy and grid modernization. Uh, Nevada is a leader in renewable energy generation, especially solar, and has committed to a 50% standard by 2030 and a goal of net zero emissions by 2050. But to achieve these goals, Nevada uh, and Across, just not in Nevada, but also across the U.S., major upgrades will obviously be needed to the grid uh, infrastructure. How does the administration plan to support and manage the upgrades needed to modernize the power grid and support new renewable energy sources? Yeah, I absolutely agree that we, we have got to invest in a 21st century grid that powers the 21st century economy. We are creating your goals, uh, our uh, mirror or uh, maybe informed the U.S.'s decision to go to have that as their goal as well. So we need to make investments in our transmission lines to help move the electricity to where it's needed. So we need to add capacity to the grid. We need to add resiliency to the grid. Uh, we need to harden the grid. Uh, the Department of Energy has been leading in this space. You're aware, I'm sure, through the uh, coordination efforts of the Grid Modernization Initiative that brings our R&D offices and national labs together with utilities and regulators and policymakers to support the research. Um, I think it's also important to note as we talk about the grid that in order to add capacity, we're gonna need to be able to make those investments. The American Jobs Plan has a significant component of, its, of that infrastructure piece attached to the transmission grid. So hopefully that can be the way that we're able to get across the finish line, the building of the grid that we know that we need. Great, you know, your answer just leads to my final uh, point I'd like to make. Uh, Beyond our reputation as a national leader in energy generation, we're also recognized for our progress in data storage security. Uh, companies like Switch, which is headquartered in my district, are enabling new technological capabilities to ensure uh, secure data storage and transfer. So as you mentioned, uh, hardening our, our grid security, I hope that you will um, accept our invitation to visit and learn from our local leaders here uh, who are working to help the DOE improve its data storage. We'd love to have you come visit. Invitation accepted. Thank you. And I yield. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Susie Lee and Chuck Fleischman. Thank you uh, for working together on that interim storage issue. And I hope also the department can comment on what can we use the Yucca Mountain Hole for? Uh, maybe you can give some thought to that as well, since the taxpayers have invested in it. Um, I wanted to uh, turn next to uh, Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I know we've talked a lot about Hanford. I, I did also want to hit on it. Um, as the Columbia River makes up the southern border of my district in southwest Washington state, and we're obviously directly downstream from Hanford, um, where 
approximately 56 million gallons of nuclear waste is stored in underground tanks. And I know that um, Representative Lee, uh, Representative Fleischman, uh, Representative Newhouse are all in this space. And I wanted to just add my voice that this is obviously, um, you know, my feeling is this is a significant uh, federal liability. Um, and getting it out of the tanks and treating it is critically important for my district and the environmental health of our region and the wild salmon runs that are very important um, to those of us uh, who live along the Columbia River. Columbia River. Um, and with that in mind, Department of Energy announced last week that the single uh, shell tanks at Hanford uh, B109 uh, is linking. Um, and it was somewhat reassuring to hear uh, that DOE has stated that the leak poses no imminent threat to the groundwater or to the public and that our governor, Jay Inslee, um, has agreed with this assessment. Um, but obviously there are a lot of folks uh, concerned and I know this is uh, I know this is on your radar there's no way it's not um, and I, I just wanted to raise that and say it's also an issue that I'm following and then I'm, I I want to switch uh, to ask a question about pump storage um, again along the Columbia River as you go up to my dist up my district um, the water power technologies offices within EERE uh, released a pump storage hydropower valuation guidebook in March of 2021, and that used the Goldendale closed loop pump storage project in my district as a case study. I was thrilled about this. Um, pump storage hydropower, like nearly uh, the nearly 1300 megawatt, a 20 hour Goldendale project can provide cleaner energy, more jobs to our communities, and more than three, more than 3000 actually in our case in, in Goldendale. So I wanted to ask what role you see pump storage hydropower playing in the path to a more renewable energy uh, in Washington state and on and across the nation, obviously. Yeah, I, um, I agree with you. I mean, having, I come, Michigan has a huge um, pump storage facility off of Lake Michigan as well. It serves uh, as delivering some great uh, energy and energy storage uh, in our state. So I understand the importance of, of it and of, you know, the, the need to be able to develop this clean source mm -hmm. of, of energy. We all know that um, these big facilities are very expensive, but it's another um, aspect of how as a nation, we may want to choose to invest Mm -hmm. upfront to bring down the cost, to cost share, to do public-private partnerships, to make sure that hydropower, whether it's pump storage, frankly, or other types of, of dams, and we can get into the, the other issues related to dams as well, but I think that it's a key piece, and if it works, and there's different kinds of um, pump storage that's being developed now through um, research and development also, including um, um, removable pump storage, which is really, really excited. So exciting. So we, we are looking at these, this is part of a place-based strategy, depending on where, um, you know, where a community sits, what the elevations are, what the circumstances are, but I'm a big believer in pump storage and in hydro, hydropower to begin with. Oh, that's good to hear. I appreciate that. And um, kind of furthering that along on the, the energy storage line, um, 2020, DOE established the Energy Storage Grand Challenge as the department's first ever complex-wide energy storage strategy. And DOE finalized the Grand Challenge roadmap in December, laying out a strategy for the U.S. to innovate here, make it here, deploy it everywhere. Um, and that includes key performance targets for a range of advanced energy storage technologies. And this initiative enjoys bipartisan support in Congress. Um, the Energy Act of 2020 established the Energy Storage Demonstration Program through my legislation, the Better Energy Storage Technology Act, the BEST Act. Um, and I just wanted to hear what actions you will uh, hope, I hope that you'll be taking to ensure the department continues to prioritize the Energy Storage Grand Challenge. I'm so glad that uh, you raised this and so glad for your leadership on it because the Biden administration has made um, big commitments to supporting a transition to this net zero carbon economy. And part of that, of course, is getting mm -hmm. to be, uh, to make big plays in energy storage innovation. And so winning on storage means um, not only support in, in critical early and applied R&D, but also in addressing sort of the domestic manufacturing barriers across the 
supply chain and driving that demonstration and financing and deployment of the new technologies for grid and transportation and other uses. We were excited uh, to announce the next phase of construction of the energy storage launch pad in Washington, the grid storage launch pad, and we are continuing uh, to advance energy storage innovation across all of these fronts and to further advance the technology through demonstration and deployment strategies like what you see in the American Jobs Plan. The Thank gentle you. lady's time Thank has so expired. Much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I must say, I share that deep interest in hydropower. And I've yeah. often wondered why in my part of the country uh, where there is some elevation, I mean, it's not Niagara Falls out here where we are, but uh, why, it isn't, why isn't there more innovation in that area? I really don't know the answer to my own question. So thank you, Congresswoman Herrera Butler, very much for your leadership on that. Congressman Kilmer, Congressman Derek Kilmer. Thank you, Madam thank Chair you. and uh, Madam Secretary, good to see you. I hope if the last 20 minutes have any takeaway, it's that there's plenty to see in the state of Washington. Uh, I'm proud to represent the only marine lab in the DOE complex. As I shared with you recently, it's uh, PNNL's Marine and Coastal Research Lab in Squim, Washington. And I, I really look forward to the chance to host you for an in-person visit when you are able. Uh, the EERE Water Power Technology Office is the single, um, is the largest single sponsor of the work at the marine lab especially through PNNL's leadership of the Powering the Blue Economy initiative focused on bringing power to ocean-based applications and remote coastal communities. But being on the coast also gives them a unique firsthand view of how coastal ecosystems are affected by climate change and can hopefully be made more resilient and be able to adapt to our changing conditions. So I was pleased to see that the skinny budget proposed a significant e increase for foundational research with a focus on climate and clean energy science. Um, we have one of the crown jewels in my district when it comes to understanding climate change and working to mitigate it. So I was hoping you could just share with us your view on the role you see DOE and the labs playing in advancing ocean and coastal science and, and technology for addressing climate change. Yeah, thank you. thanks for asking that. I know the Marine Science Lab at uh, PNNL supports, as you were saying, a wide range of research capabilities, including, you know, the biotechnical side and um, harnessing uh, sustainable energy from in coastal environments, you know, and the study of environmental impacts on marine species and access to um, diverse marine environments. I'm super interested in, um, because of our, our Department of Energy piece of things, I'm really interested in exploring the energy components of uh, clean energy, whether it is wave power, whether it's, you know, um, floating turbines. I mean, you name it, there's a whole array of technologies in addition to the um, sustainable environmental research that's being done. So I hope to visit the facility in my time as, um, as secretary and see firsthand the amazing uh, work that's being done. And I still am um, thrilled that it's in SQUIM. We're, um, I'm gonna get a punch card for the number of times SQUIM or SQUIM is mentioned <laughs> in this committee. I, I'm gonna get a free latte out of this, I'm sure. Um, I, I represent a district that is unfortunately already uh, seeing the consequences of climate change in coastal areas. And uh, I appreciate that the administration's skinny budget called for quadrupling clean energy research over the next four years, including more than $8 billion for DOE research uh, in, uh, in fiscal year 2022. Um, with President Biden calling for the electric power sector to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2035, I'm, I'm proud that Washington state's already a leader in this effort. We're lucky to have a lot of clean energy tools in our toolbox already, but we know there's a lot of work to do in the advanced renewable space and grid modernization to meet this ambitious but scientifically mandated goal. So where do you see the most bang for DOE's buck when it comes to catalyzing investments in new carbon-free energy technologies? Do you, do you plan to prioritize specific technologies, whether that be wind or solar or nuclear, or will the focus be on how to effectively meet different categories of demand, like baseload versus peak versus on demand? Yeah, this is a great, a great question. And you know, you love all of your children, all of your renewable energy and clean energy technologies. But I do think in terms of the biggest bang for your buck, um, I think research will demonstrate that it still is in solar and wind. 
Um, you know, we just announced that big offshore wind goal of 30 gigawatts, and that's really important. We've got to add, though, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gigawatts of clean energy to the grid. And so our focus will be both on doing the research that's necessary, but also now on deploying. And one of the biggest tools that we have in our deployment toolbox is through our loan programs office. And they are working on uh, the whole suite of technologies to be able to assist in, in, in that deployment. And as you probably are aware, the president has a climate cabinet. So we are working together, the offices across government. So, you know, the Department of Interior is um, part of that. We want to make the you know, Department of Transportation is a part of that. Obviously, if we're going to add capacity to the grid, some of that is due to the increased demand due to electrification of the transportation sector. So that means that we also have to um, not just uh, invest in the grid, but invest in energy storage and the capabilities associated with those batteries inside of the vehicles. And that means we have to invest in the supply chain to those. This is why this energy sector, man, there's just so much in terms of economic opportunity across the country, because whether you are mining for, um, for cobalt or lithium, or you are installing batteries in electric vehicles, or you're installing them on the grid, or you're installing wind turbines, or you're installing solar panels, or you're making any of those, it's just the whole suite. But in terms of the biggest bang for your buck, in terms of adding gigawatts to the grid, it still continues to be in solar and wind. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I just, as I call on uh, Congressman Reschenthaler, I just wanted to mention Congresswoman Frankel uh, would be next in line, Congresswoman Bustos, Congresswoman Watson Coleman, and Congressman Ryan. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for your endurance. Congressman uh, Reschenthaler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you also to Ranking Member Simpson for, for holding this hearing today. And obviously, Madam Secretary, thanks for being here as well. Uh, Madam Secretary, as you, as you might know, I don't, I don't know if you do know, but Nettle, has, um, Nettle is right outside my district. And it's been a long-term global leader in carbon, uh, carbon capture research and development. And during the last administration, Nettle and the DOE partnered with, uh, with industry to conduct detailed engineering studies on building commercial scale uh, carbon capture projects. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see the DOE's recent FOA to continue, continue these partnerships. So, so with that, Madam Secretary, can you describe how your department plans to develop a portfolio of carbon capture applications from uh, power plants to industrial applications to carbon removal as Congress authorizes uh, the Energy Act? Yeah, thank you for asking this question. As um, I was mentioning, we've got the Fossil Energy Office and you'll see that there will be an increase coming to you for, for them for this work on carbon capture because they will be doing all of this work in carbon management and um, in partnering with Nettle. And, you know, CCUS is obviously a key part of technologies that hold this amazing promise for reducing mitigation, mitigating carbon pollution, both on the industrial um, side and on the power plant side. Um, it's just really, uh, it's important for you to know that the head of um, Nettle right now is a fellow named Brian Anderson, Dr. Brian Anderson. We just appointed him to be head of our intergovernmental working group on coal and power plant communities to be able to bring these kinds of technologies to, um, to coal and fossil communities to make sure we can prove them out and um, not only install the technologies, but we would like to see as industrial center, industrial sectors, industrial ecosystems around building those technologies and then being uh, effectively able to export them. That's true on carbon capture. It is true on um, blue hydrogen, for example, being able to attach um, steam methane reform uh, to uh, natural gas in those communities that are fossil communities to clean up and sequester. That means you have to build pipelines uh, as well. So that's another job component. So the bottom line is the technologies associated with fossil fuels and managing the carbon from those fossil fuels are a big priority of the Department of Energy and certainly of our our fossil energy office and of the administration. Thanks, Madam Secretary. With um, the two minutes I have remaining, I just want to talk about alternatives to uh, uses of carbon. Uh, accelerating accelerating and deploying alternate uses of coal. I'm sorry, 
I meant coal, not carbon. Oh, um, yeah, excuse me. Uh, when, when we look at this, you know, you can look at Nettle and Nettle is currently overseeing early stage uh, process, an early stage process to develop material from coal, including coal uh, derived carbon foams and uh, coal to plastic composites. Uh, but I think more investment is needed to turn these materials into actual products that are they're used in the real world for real world a application. So just two, two uh, part question, what is the department uh, doing to facilitate and accelerate this R&D? And is there interagency coordination or opportunities for collaboration? Uh, with that, I yield back to you. Yes, yes, there is. And yes, we're really interested in both um, extracting critical minerals from coal, using, um, extracting uh, materials that can be reused, so recycling essentially, um, coal waste is, uh, is being explored by Nettle, but um, there's also a critical minerals institute at, um, at, in Iowa at the Ames Laboratory. Um, you know, getting critical minerals as well out of recycled product, products um, like batteries that have been uh, left, you know, that are, that are through their life cycle. And, and I would say too, I mean, I know you didn't specifically, you asked about coal and recycling, but I'll just say because it feeds into this notion of critical um, minerals and critical materials, we've got to, as a nation, think about what the whole life stream of that is, including being able to mine responsibly for critical minerals and process them, because we do not have any processing of critical minerals uh, in terms of like cobalt or lithium, et cetera, for batteries in the United States. So that whole suite is what we're focused on and we are absolutely coordinated inside the department and with the Department of Defense as well, who are, is very interested in us uh, being able to take this forward. And I would, and I would just say it's, it's actually beneficial to us from an environmental standpoint to mine cobalt and these minerals here when we have environmental standards, as opposed to relying on China or nations in Africa that don't have the standards that we have. But Madam Chair, thank you so much. Um, I, will, I will see you on the second round and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Russian Thaler. Uh, Congresswoman Frankel. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Madam Secretary. As, thank you for being with us. Uh, congratulations, what a great appointment by the, uh, the president. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that the pandemic has been especially hard on women in terms of jobs. More women have dropped out of the job market. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, which are, you know, schools closing, their jobs were just, uh, people were not uh, going to their job places. And uh, I love, I love the president's family and job plan. Uh, but I read a study that said that traditional infrastructure jobs are mostly filled by men. So my first question to you is, uh, what are you planning to do or what can be done to make sure that women get their fair share of these infrastructure jobs? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, I mean, again, it depends on how you define infrastructure, right? Because yeah. many believe that the care infrastructure is infrastructure yes. as well, and that's included in the American Jobs Plan. But with respect to traditional infrastructure, and I would say as well at the Department of Energy, we're focused on science, technology, engineering, and math. So the STEM fields, which disproportionately have, have um, gone to, uh, to men. Um, and I would say we have a diversity problem in, with respect to people of color in um, the STEM field. So women and people of color. And, you know, I, this is a priority for the Biden administration in terms of the pipeline. The data makes it clear that action is necessary. We can't compete if we aren't empowering every American to bring their best if we are not, if we're not holding up women. So um, the workforce training piece of things on the traditional infrastructure is important. Let me just say that it's not just lifting and heavy. There's a lot of logistics work associated with infrastructure in the traditional um, bricks and mortar sense. And uh, there's a lot of women who are interested in moving into that. I, I use uh, every opportunity, and I hope you do too, to be able to uphold some of the trades works that is that are being done now because women are moving in, but it's it's in a much it's at a much slower pace. But I will say they're great jobs and they provide great benefits. And we want to encourage diversifying um, the skilled trades 
as well as the logistics and the design and the architecture and um, the science pieces, the soup to nuts um, bringing of women on. Let me just say a word about what we're doing at DOE. We are really focused on beefing up that pipeline. We've taken all these projects and our, our national labs have to the universities that often they are attached to, to really open up and give people, give diverse communities a window into what it's like to be able to be a scientist at the labs and solving the world's biggest problems. I'm glad to say that this next generation of interns that we are seeing is much more diverse, but we have a lot more work to do. Well, I'm really happy to hear your comments. And just my comments shouldn't be interpreted to mean that that women need to be pushed into men's jobs. I believe that women's work should be uh, they should be paid their fair wages. And as I know of a, 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 a wonderful advocate, uh, I hope that when you get with your cabinet, that you, that you really push to make sure whatever job plan we push that women are going to be able to get back into the job market, whether that's in the care industry, which is so important, and make sure women are being paid properly. My, my, my second, I'm going to tell you this quick question. The president has, he has a goal of cutting greenhouse emissions in, in half by the end of decade. Just on a big picture, what's the most important thing as a society we have to do? Is it to change the way our transportation, the way we build buildings, the way we light up buildings? What, what, what's the big picture? If you can wave a magic wand. Yeah, I mean, as you, you started to mention it. it is not just one thing, it is a suite of things. We have to focus on efficiency. So that means the buildings sector, we have to focus on transportation because we haven't done what we need to do. So that means batteries, electric vehicles, charging stations. We certainly have to add new generation to the electric grid and we've got to manage the emissions that we are already in the midst of spewing, which is what this carbon capture use and sequestration is all about. We've got, you know, we've got so many potential job creation opportunities. Again, I, I just focus on the jobs because I'm obsessed with job creation, but in the whole suite of clean energy, um, of clean energy gigawatts that we have to add to the grid, there's huge amount of jobs and it's in the whole suite of things. So don't ask me to pick one, it's gotta be all. It's a shotgun, not a silver bullet. All right, thank you, Madam Secretary. I you back. Right. Thank you, I wanna thank Congresswoman Franco for her leadership always on inclusion. And uh, I wanted to say to the secretary in the past administration and even before that, I've tried to get the secretaries of energy to come up with a creative idea that would engage members of Congress in locating individuals who could um, come to the DOE in some capacity. Uh, for example, I will make you aware that members appoint young people. We, we nominate people to West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy, uh, et cetera. And every year we do that. We have a congressional arts competition. We pick individuals and they win an award and their uh, artwork is hung in the capital of the United States. Every member does that. And uh, we have no such opportunity from the Department of Energy, whether it would be to uh, you know select someone who could work in one of the labs, uh, send names in, send a set of names in. The same is true with the, um, uh, I don't know if the department's going to create a climate core, but I really would urge you to consider in this early part of the administration, a way to better connect members to their own constituencies and places in America that have never touched the Department of Energy, where there are uh, institutions of higher learning and community engagement and uh, I just put that on the record, and I thank uh, Congresswoman Frankel for uh, trying to help America be more inclusive at every level. Uh, now uh, we'll per turn to uh, Congresswoman uh, Sherry Bustos of Illinois. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, and also to our ranking member. Uh, Secretary Gramholm, uh, very good to see you and appreciate you being here for the, the hearing so we can really talk a little bit about uh, taking a closer look at your Department of Energy budget and request for 2022. Um, I don't think this has been approached yet, but I'm certainly um, maybe going to be uh, the first person to bring this up to you, at least for this subcommittee uh, hearing. But renewable fuels like biodiesel and ethanol, uh, really, really important to rural economies. Uh, we've got 40% of the corn that's produced domestically is processed to produce ethanol. And these fuels have the potential to reduce our carbon emissions right now. And I, I always wanna make sure that I bring that up because I come from corn country and soybean country. 
But I'm um, wondering, uh, Madam Secretary, where do you feel that biofuels will fit into the Department of Energy's um, and the Biden administration's blueprint for a net zero future? Great. Uh, thank you for asking this. We, we actually have a whole biofuels and bioenergy team that's working on this, and they do great work. So I'm really glad that you, that you asked. Um, electric vehicles obviously have emerged as this great technology, which they are for light duty vehicles like cars and, and SUVs. But um, pickups, uh, heavy duty transportation uh, modes uh, that really need more of an energy density of liquid fuels, that is where biofuels are gonna play a critical role. And that's especially true in aviation and marine fuels. So we think they have a huge role to play, uh, especially in, you know, long haul trucking, um, you know, other areas too, like, you know, can we meet critical needs with biofuels relying on, on sustainable production methods and sources and, and levels. So I feel very bullish about this bottom line. We see biofuels playing a big role and we think that those refineries can be producing and should be producing um, aviation biofuels right now because the aviation industry is really interested as a demand to create, to take that offtake. Uh, this is very exciting to be, and it's not much to retrofit a biofuel refinery to be able to produce aviation fuel. So we've got our team working on this and I will keep you posted because I think it's really exciting. Very good. Th thank you, Madam Secretary. And looking forward to, to working with you on that. Um, if we can uh, go to nuclear energy for just a second, I know we've uh, we've had some questions about this, but uh, as you look at the last several years, uh, Congress has included funds for efforts to extend the life of existing commercial nuclear reactor fleets. Um, these are funds that have been important for nuclear power stations and, and the jobs. We've been talking a lot about jobs. You've been talking a lot about jobs, but the really, really good jobs that they support. Um, and, and it is true in, in, in and around the congressional district that I represent. Um, wondering what what you see as the role for the existing nuclear fleet in the budget request and what specific R&D activities can be pursued to maintain the cost, competitiveness, and vitality of the current fleet of nuclear power plants for their life expectancy? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the DOE not, has not historically subsidized plants, but I think this is a moment to consider, and perhaps it's in the American Jobs Plan or somewhere, to make sure that we keep the current fleet active. The U.S. Uh, has, what, 93 operating nuclear reactors, and that accounts for 52 percent of our um, emissions-free electricity generation. And as you say, they employ thousands of people. I mean, you get, I think in Illinois, you've got a couple of, maybe even four reactors that are scheduled to come offline and you know we're not going to be able to achieve our climate goals if our nuclear power plants uh, shut down we have to find ways to keep them operating and um so one way of course is um, i know the american jobs plan establishes an energy efficiency and clean energy standard which includes nuclear and and that creates demand for nuclear power right um while cutting electricity bills but this question of direct some direct subsidy or some way to support these plants to stay open. That's still an open question, but I know that there that this administration would be eager to work with Congress on it. Very good. And we look forward to working with you on that. Um, with my remaining 20 some seconds, I will yield back the remainder of my time. And Madam Secretary, thank you very much for your time. You thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Bustos. And uh, as always, uh, you have your finger on what's important. Uh, I wanted to uh, say to the secretary that on the nuclear issue, I'm glad to hear the administration is taking a very close look at that. I think many members of this committee, maybe all, uh, share a deep concern about that. And I think uh, uh, linking whatever is going to be proposed to your place-based strategy for long-term um, development uh, <laughs> holds great potential uh, for places in the country that are still digging out from the uh, 2008 recession. And um, that's a longer conversation. Just also to put on the record that the Department of Energy has signed an executive agreement with the Department of Agriculture, never fully developed, to work in different areas. Uh, Congresswoman Bustos talked about uh, renewable fuels, uh, very important issue, as well as carbon capture in those fields. But um, 
the um, Barbara, Congresswoman Barbara Lee and I have been working for years to no avail with the Department of Energy and the Department of Agriculture on creating a, a climate-controlled four-season uh, greenhouse uh, that would be able to produce food, obviously, and uh, have had more trouble with linking the Department of Agriculture to the Department of Energy despite this executive agreement. The current greenhouses leach CO2 like crazy, and they uh, there are a lot of other energy efficiencies that can be included in materials research and so forth. So here you have two members of Congress. I don't want to mix up Congresswoman Susie Lee, who's on our subcommittee with Congresswoman Barbara Lee, but as Barbara Lee, uh, who also serves on appropriations, we are both really highly frustrated. It isn't your fault. You're brand new. But we're, I'm just saying that on this issue of energy and agriculture, there has to be some continuing dialogue. It shouldn't be this hard to get these two mammoth departments to work together on key energy-related technologies. So I just wanted to We'll send a follow-up. You don't have to say a word. That's another issue that's up before we sort of on your plate. Uh, Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. You know, it's um, it's kind of t- tough being at the end of the question line because my uh, colleagues and I share so many of the same interests. So it's good to see you, Secretary, and congratulations on your appointment. You certainly have uh, represented yourself here as the person that should be in this position at this time. So I thank you. Um, So I had a lot of questions, most of which have been answered, but I want to run through a couple. This whole issue of uh, nuclear energy, I am very concerned about what we can do with the spent fuel. Other countries um, recycle it and use it for more energy. I'm wondering, do we have any research projects into looking at that issue in particular? Yes, we do. Um, we are okay. looking at it, and of course, we are um, interested in figuring out what to do yeah. with the existing boatload of waste uh, spent fuel that we already have out there too. But both are happening. Thank you. Um, I was happy to hear Val Kilmer, my 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 colleague, speak to you about uh, the whole issue of coastal resiliency because New Jersey, you know, is a coastal state. So I don't have to ask you that because it's already been addressed. Um, I, my, my sister here, uh, Lois Frankel, has raised a diversity issue, and um, she and I both share this, this issue. I'm very concerned about the underrepresentation of people of color in the leadership positions in the uh, national laboratories, and I want to know what you all are thinking of doing to encourage greater recruitment um, and greater uh, employment. Of, of those individuals in particular? Yeah, we, we, are, we have a full-on program. In fact, we just had, uh, is today the 6th? Uh, yeah, yesterday, no, yes, May the, May the 4th. On May 4th, we had a Jedi, as in Star Wars, but it meant justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion effort to really elevate this and to put specific goals on having um, both uh, a pipeline that is diverse, but also that we are looking at what the entire department looks like. I mean, to be honest, the Department of Energy needs to do work on this. And we have been very strategic and specifically focused on um, making diversity a top priority, making equity a top priority. Shalanda Baker, I just appointed as our head head of our Department of, uh, of our equity efforts across the board. And she also serves on our external facing efforts uh, for frontline communities. So, so no, we are all in on this. It is critical yeah. that we develop this pipeline that is diverse because that's, um, that's also how you get the best science done. Thank you, you ma'am. I, I look forward to having further information coming forth and having this discussion as we move, as we move further into the future. Yeah. Uh, my last question has to do with FERC. I introduced the Safer Pipeline Act, which would improve the FERC review process for national gas pipeline projects. Um, And I'm very concerned about FERC expanding its review process to take into consideration things like the impact on natural resources, the impact, the socioeconomic uh, impact, the environmental impact, the impact on communities, as well as the consequences as the concentration of projects already in certain areas where they're entertaining a new application. It doesn't seem that they take into consideration what's already there 
and is this particular project needed or can this project connect to another project um, and therefore not cause any more disruptions. But even in that vein, with regard to just sort of other energy projects coming forth, how do we ensure that there is this examination um, in the in the area that the projects are being proposed that takes into consideration what exists, its socioeconomic and environmental impact on what already exists? Yeah, this it's a this is a great question. I um, and with respect to FERC, I I have a biweekly meeting with the new chairman, uh, Chairman Glick. And I know they're looking at this. And if you'd like, I can follow up with him and make sure that we brief you in particular on what their process is. I can't have a conversation with him about specific um, cases that they may be looking at, but in terms of general policy, I know he's very sensitive to this context sensitive argument. And I would be happy to arrange a follow up with you on it so that you know exactly what they're looking at. Thank you. I'm very interested in having that conversation because in the last administration, I wasn't so confident that we were looking at the far range implication of placement of new projects uh, where there were already existing projects. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I yield, Madam Chair. You Thank Thanks. you very much, Congresswoman uh, Watson Coleman. And you stayed within the time limit. Uh, hard to do sometimes. Congressman Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, uh, Madam Secretary. Great to see you. I hope that uh, I, I love watching you and our chairwoman uh, interact. I think of uh, Michigan and Toledo and Ohio and and uh, who says Ohio and Michigan can't get along and get something good done together. Uh, Amen. So we're, we're, excited, <laughs> we're excited to have you. I've got a couple of very uh, parochial Ohio centric uh, questions that I just want to run by you. Uh, on the 20th of, of this uh, January, um, the Department of Energy announced that it was partnering with Youngstown State University and DOE's Oak Ridge National Lab, which you heard a lot about from the gentleman from Tennessee, um, to uh, develop uh, an advanced workforce development for the battery manufacturing industry. And there's $1 million involved in it to assist in the development of an energy storage workforce innovation center, which will serve as a training center based in the Midwest. And the training center would support the battery and EV manufacturing industry in Northeast Ohio, which has now uh, become known as the Voltage Valley due to the number of investments made by the electric vehicle industry and helping supply a capable workforce. So the development of the National Energy Storage Workforce Training and Innovation Center will be key to building a sustainable workforce for all sectors within the energy storage industry. And this center concept is already in development through a partnership with General Motors and Altium Cells in partnership with Youngstown State. Um, I know this investment is going to be put to good use, but I'm hopeful that it's not just a one-time investment because we have a lot of work to do here to bring not only the energy department's resources, but also its expertise uh, to these areas as we're talking about uh, developing these other pockets. Um, and so many times, uh, as our chairwoman advocates for, some of these regions get overlooked both uh, by DC and venture capitalists that drive the kind, the kind of innovation that we need. So what plans does the department have to assist places like Northeast Ohio that are outside the typical high tech, high venture capital regions? Yeah, Congressman, I know you and I have spoken about this and we share this <laughs> this deep uh, love for the industrial Midwest and congratulations, you guys got that battery plant, which is fantastic. And as we often say with respect to workforce development, you can't develop a workforce when the jobs aren't there, but when the job is there, then you can really tailor, cir tailor training around those job creation opportunities. So if we're gonna create an industrial cluster that's called Voltage Valley, that means that workforce has to be a key component of it and it has to be ongoing. So this is a conversation I know that I have had, not specifically with respect to Ohio, but in general with respect to um, uh, creating industrial clusters with uh, Secretary Walsh at the Department of Labor. This has to be a commitment on the part of industry and government to have an ongoing support. And obviously, as you know, 
often it's in partnership with a, a local provider like a community college as well that gets inculcated into a curriculum, a curriculum that's nimble because the technology is changing all the time as well. So we are fully supportive of this wraparound strategy of creating place-based industrial clusters. You've got the start of that with this, um, you've got more than a start, but at least with this job creation, job provider announcement. And now working with GM, working with the um, cell manufacturer, having a, a um, strategy that trains people specifically how they would like to be trained on site um, is key. And I will just quickly say, because I, I don't want to absorb too much of your time, but the apprenticeship model that um, has been identified in the American Jobs Plan, for example, would be a perfect fit for this, because having apprenticeships, obviously, that hands-on experience is really critical to uh, getting a good job uh, down the pike. Great. Well, Great. we'll follow up with that. Um, another uh, area that I represent is the Appalachian region. Um, which is part of my district that has produced a, a, a good deal of energy over the years, made steel, grown the food, has done, you know, a lot of things right over the years. Um, and with the modern global economy, many of these communities have been left behind, as we've talked about. So I, I know you're committed to this, but I want to address a quick issue uh, in Ohio, in a community in Ohio that I've been working on for over a decade now in Pike County. And it's a small rural Appalachian community in southern Ohio. Uh, and it was selected by the U.S. government to construct a gaseous diffusion plant in the 1950s. It was producing enriched uranium for our nuclear arsenal. And for decades, people worked there, Cold War, um, and then it was used for commercial reactors. The operation ceased in 2001. And I just want to get this on your radar screen, Madam Chair, if I can get an additional uh, few seconds here. Um, the, the operation stopped in one, uh, 2001, and since then, previous administrations decided, decided to construct a landfill on the current site and bury much of the contaminated waste in this community's backyard. It was about 1,000 feet uh, from the nearest resident, and obviously the local community protested this, and they wanted the waste to be removed and disposed of in a, se a separate location. So in recent years, Following the record of decision where determination was made to dispose most of the waste on site, the community discovered the presence, uh, presence of radioactive isotopes outside the plant's footprint. The local middle school was quarantined two years ago when, DOE, when a DOE monitor across the street registered positive hits for Neptunium. So I've been told by the community members that subsequent testing revealed the presence of enriched uranium inside the school and in a tragic turn of events several children that attended the middle school have been diagnosed with and succumbed to cancer and pike county now has the highest rate of cancer incidents in the entire state of ohio which is saying something so bottom line is the doe has funded uh radiological testing throughout the community so that you could ascertain the extent of the off-site contamination and those results are expected later this year Despite these concerns, Wall Street Journal said that the last week that the open air demolition of this enormous structure at the plant is imminent within the week. And the community, as you can imagine, is uh, up in arms uh, about the whole thing. So I just want to see if you would commit to a meeting with those people uh, at the local level so we can get uh, some idea at the top levels of the Department of Energy about the challenges uh, and potential for this site. Uh, 3,700 acres, and it has enormous potential, but we want to make sure that the people around there are safe. So I would love to get you on a call with those folks. Yeah, okay. I, I, I know you're over time, but I just want to say I know Ike White, who's head of our emergency management department, has met with local community. I'm happy to follow up with you. Obviously, safety is the highest priority. So thank you for, for raising it. We can follow up. Great. Thank I appreciate you. it, Madam Secretary. And Madam Chair, I'm going to submit another uh, question uh, for the record as well. So All right. Thank, thank you, you Congressman Ryan. Time. I gave you I gave you extra time for the children. And, thank you. Uh, and uh, Speaker Pelosi always says we're here for the children. So um, thank you. And thank you, Madam Secretary. We're now going to move into a second round. Uh, I will uh, ask a question or two, then we'll move to a ranking member Simpson, then Congresswoman Franco. Congressman Fleischman, Newhouse, and Russian Thaler. So, um, Madam Secretary, I hope somebody's giving you a glass of water there. You've really been. Uh, really <laughs> <stolen>. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> All right. My uh, question relates to weatherization, uh, the built environment, and place-based strategies. We know that the weatherization program is one of the department's most meaningful uh, uh, meet-the-street efforts uh, through retrofitting uh, existing structures. Uh, President Biden, uh, through the American Jobs Plan, calls uh, to, called to build, preserve, and retrofit more than 2 million homes and commercial buildings. We know that's not enough. But the weatherization program does deliver energy efficiency and climate savings to low-income Americans across our nation, and a, it's a lifeline uh, for millions recovering from uh, economic turmoil. To make the program work better, I've been fighting for a long time to bring the weatherization-related federal agencies to the same table. On the ground, weatherization participants do not see the difference between LIHEAP, the Department of Energy, or HUD funding, and I'm excited to work with you and welcome your leadership to develop better coordination among the agencies uh, on these programs. I have two questions. One, how do we effectively ratchet up the weatherization program from the local level up to make sure these programs are ready and capable to meet our climate goals? And number two, how can the weatherization program uh, link to the newly authorized Department of Weatherization uh, program that's called innovation in that sector, the community scale weatherization pilot, and pilot efforts at HUD focused on better coordination in this sector of housing retrofit to deliver a more equitable, just, and resilient and timely <laughs> reality for Americans and communities struggling to heat, cool, and retrofit their homes. There is a disjuncture between uh, again, these departments, HHS, HUD, and DOE. Uh, could you address that in some way, and if not fully, answer for the record? Yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, Madam Chair. I so appreciate your instinct to desire and desire to have a federal government that actually works in tandem, where all of the pieces know what their role is, what their lane is, and that there's no crossover, but there's efficiency. So, um, in, in the summary that we sent of the budget, we, I described the Building uh, Clean Energy Projects Initiative, which is an effort that coordinates across self, several programs that you're discussing, including the weatherization assistance uh, program, which we're proposing to increase. And you'll get that budget when you have the detail. And, and uh, you can see, you'll be able to see that it will be a major component of building a um, a clean energy economy in which buildings and weatherization are a key part of that. One, the build, let me just give you an example, the Build Back Better Challenge Grant Program that is uh, intended to incentivize cities and states and tribes to do, um, for example, um, upgrade their building codes to be able to make sure that we are building back better, but also to work with HUD and to work with our counterparts to make sure that the right and the left hand knows what they are doing. So the, you know, I fully intend to work with my counterparts across the agencies to make sure we're coordinated and collaborating, collaborating really on these, uh, on these programs for all Americans. And I'll just say that DOE's program teams have a well-established history and practice of working with other agencies, but your point about the community agencies not knowing the difference or community people in the community not knowing the difference between LIHEAP and weatherization assistance, et cetera, is a really good one. We've got to double down on this collaboration to make it seamless and clear for people who are working out there. But know that we are, the good news is that there we're hoping to get support for a budget that increases the funding to make this happen so that more people can have their homes weatherized and particularly vulnerable folks who really need to spend their money on uh, either rent or food and not on leaky windows. Yes, ma'am. Secretary, thank you. I really do think this sector needs your leadership because as we move forward in Ohio, I can't speak for every state, but when the department disperses its money, it comes to the state capitol and then they send it out to the counties. Well, if you're a rural county, sometimes it's a little bit easier than if you're one of the big metropolitan counties. And um, I won't go into all the details, but um, the issue of workforce development, I think Department of Labor should be involved in this as well, and recruitment so that we can connect individuals to developing a skill. That is not done 
I was with a man who'd worked in a weatherization program for 25 years on furnaces. I said, where did you get your apprenticeship? Where did you get? He goes, what are you talking about? And I told him about apprenticeship journeyman. He goes, I could have done that. So believe me, even after all these years, there's a huge disconnect out there at the grassroots level. So we're not being as successful. And then what good does it do to fix a furnace when the roof leaks? But DOE's not in charge of roofs. So who is in charge of roofs, HUD? Uh, you know, this is a crazy program in some ways, and I support it. I've increased it. But I see the management dysfunction, uh, despite wonderful people trying all over. This could really be an important legacy program. And I've asked the HUD recently to please su- provide to the record how many senior citizens across this country need roofs. Uh, they're looking into that. Uh, if we think about Build Back Better and homes in the existing uh inventory, we have to have people at the top who are well enough informed about the housing stock to know where we need to focus and people at labor experienced enough to know how to help move people into whole house retrofit. So enough said, you'll get uh, some additional questions on that, but I just wanted to bring this issue to your attention. Um, the And critical minerals, the modern global economy has increasingly uh, come to depend on access to a number of critical materials which you have addressed. And I was very pleased that President Biden, in his executive order in February, uh, aimed to create more resilient and secure supply chains for critical and essential goods. Uh, two clarifications. What steps has the Department of Energy taken in response to the executive order? And secondly, how does the Department of Energy plan to strengthen and build upon those efforts to reduce foreign dependence on critical minerals and to build more resilient supply chains? If Congressman Ruiz, the chair of the Hispanic Caucus, were on the line, he'd say, invite the secretary out to the Salton Sea because let's talk about growing up lithium. Uh, How do we do that better? How do we do it faster? So in any case, can you enlighten us a bit on how you're moving forward on that executive order? Yes, Congressman Ruiz and I had, uh, and our teams had a phone call about this very thing yesterday. So so um, you should know that um, DOE is working with uh, the other agencies, including DOD, to produce an initial report from the executive order that su- assesses the supply chain risk and recommends strategies to secure the critical material supply chains while we support our domestic economic opportunity, right? So at the same time, the department is initiating work using current authorities are what we have, what we can do right now and resources and also proposing new efforts on critical minerals and other uh, areas of the domestic supply chain starting now. So just last week, we put out a funding opportunity for research and development to extract critical minerals from coal waste, which we were describing earlier. We needed to be doing so much more of this. With respect to um, how we plan to strengthen and build on those efforts to reduce foreign dependence, underpinning, underpinning this um, critical uh, minerals effort, um, we need for uh, electric vehicles and storage and for um, motors and wind turbines and batteries, it's not just for electric vehicles. We have to do a ton here, especially increasing domestic supply. And it means looking for every source of minerals. And we're looking at innovative ways to get critical minerals out of this uh, cold waste, coal waste and recycled products. And we, we need to have the processing, but we also need to do a geothermal, uh, not a geothermal, a mineral map. We know where many of these places are. We, we just announced a, uh, an award in the Salton Sea to be able to do a demonstration project to extract critical minerals. In fact, this case, of course, lithium from the brine. Um, But we need to, this is beyond demonstration. We now need to take it really to scale. And that is true across the country. So um, our advanced manufacturing office has uh, the Critical Minerals Institute, which it supports at Ames uh, National Lab. They are uh, leveraging decades of the DOE investments on this, but the time is really now to be, to invest in the actual partnering on m- responsibly mining and then processing as well, because the processing is going to provide jobs and we simply can't mine and then send it off to our economic competitors. We should be doing the whole supply chain soup to nuts in the United States. The American Jobs Act is, a, is a, an initial um, signal of support and financial support at that for that. 
Thank you, Madam Secretary, very much. I represent one of the only, the, the only a brilliant processing facility in the country. And uh, the mining occurs out west. Uh, but obviously, we also here in um, our region do aluminum, uh, titanium, uh, we have magnesium, I mean, every UM. Uh, and uh, But it's not, it's disaggregated. It's um, and, uh, so this is, this is an area where many parts of uh, America need to put their shoulder to the wheel. I will now go to uh, Congressman, uh, Ranking Member Simpson. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, first, a couple of statements uh, that I have to make uh, before I ask this question. But, you know, I'm not one who likes to kick a dead horse very much. But since my good friend, uh, Congresswoman Lee brought it up, I feel like I have to kick this dead horse. And believe me, I do know it's a dead horse and this doesn't require a response. She said that Yucca Mountain had been both a political and a scientific failure. She's half right. It was a political failure. It was certainly was not a scientific failure. Congresswoman Kaptur wanted to know what we could do with this $14 billion hole in the ground. I've suggested that what we do is maintain it as a place to put the volumes of scientific studies that have been done on this land as a place to store them, because <laughs> they are numerous. I think there's been 53 Academy of Study Sciences, and we're going to need a place to store all that paperwork and all those computers and all that kind of stuff. So I just say that. Now, I wait with the, I await with bated breath the interim storage proposal, something that I support. I, we're going to have to have interim storage no matter what. But... I look to I look uh, to see what community is going to take ex, uh, interim storage when the federal government is not working on permanent repository, and they're likely to become the permanent repository. And how many billions of dollars it's going to cost us to, for lack of a better term, bribe those communities to take uh, this interim storage on what a hundred year basis? That's going to be a challenge for us as as we move into the future. But I do want to. Uh, raise some questions that I hope to be able to get together with you and talk about in person. Uh, uh, what's the plan for getting the integrated waste treatment uh, unit in Idaho up and running? Uh, what is the department's policy on calculating payments in lieu of taxes? Uh, this is something I've been interested in for a number of years because they're all different across the whole complex and they should be the same uh, across the complex. Uh, I want to know the department's plan for continued implementation of the GeoVision study uh, which identified great potential for geothermal energy and utilization of the forge facilities. The other thing I would say is I, I, I'm excited by this conversation of critical minerals and rare earth elements and our dependence on uh, foreign sources for those, for those uh, minerals. And if we're going to talk about battery, solar, wind, whatever you want to talk about, uh, national security, these are vitally important, but I would encourage you to go to the maps that have been made by the USGS uh, of those minerals and their availability, and a lot of them are on public lands, and I'd like to be able to get together with you at some point, talk with the Secretary of Energy, the USGS, and ourselves about how we can have access to this, because it's not just getting it out of other materials, but it is also being able to mine those materials and the process of being able to get permitted to do that. Uh, we need to streamline this process if we're not going to rely on uh, foreign materials. Having said that, let me just ask you this one last question. Uh, under the Plutonium Management and Disposition Agreement, the United States and Russia each agreed to convert 34 metric tons of surplus weapons-grade plutonium to a form that could not be uh, returned to nuclear weapons. The original plan was for the U.S. to build and operate the MOX plant in South Carolina, which would have turned the plutonium into fuel for commercial nuclear reactors after several years of debate. Uh, the department decided to switch uh, instead to a dilute and dispose approach. One of my concerns with this approach has been uh, that ensuring the DOE's attention to the challenges of the disposed part of this plan. The intent is to dispose of the diluted materials at the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, or WIP, in New Mexico. There are statutory and operational limits on how much and how quickly waste can be disposed of at WIP. Uh, there have also been lawsuits over volume calculations and delays uh, to the project to improve operations and what impact that is going to have on other sites that are waiting uh, to ship true waste uh, to WIP. Uh, can you please uh, provide an update on uh, the status of WIP and the lawsuits? Have they been resolved or are they still pending? And what is the department doing uh, to get the projects to improve the operations back on track? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, WIP is really important to DOE's uh, legacy cleanup mission. And um, the, the, the big issue has been this utility shaft, which is a, a key 
infrastructure project at WIP. And that just to get detailed for one second is to provide this new air intake, ventilation right. intake to, um, so uh, they are continuing to work with, uh, there was a, some delay in that because of COVID and they are continuing, WIP is continuing to work with the state of New Mexico to address the extension. There was an, a temporary authorization that allowed for this to happen. And now they're getting an extension on it to enable the continued construction activities due to the delay. But there, to date, just so that you know, there has been no impact on our ability to place waste at WIP. And a public hearing actually on this permit request has been scheduled for, for uh, I think, May 17th. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you for being here today. Thank Look you. Forward to working with you. You bet. Same here, same here. Thank you, Ranking Member Simpson. You're such a valuable member of Congress. Uh, Congresswoman Frankel. Hello. Okay. Thanks again. So I, I, I ask very simpleton questions. <laughs> but no, I'm not a technical person, but I, I don't say practical things. Um, so, you know, it seems to me, I think most of us, some of us know that to, re to really to get to our goals of reducing the carbon, there's going to have to be, you know, millions of electrical vehicles and we've got a, millions of solar panels and so forth. Uh, one person isn't going to do it. So, but how, how best for just an individual constituent, what do we tell them as what is their best way to be part of the solution to reducing our carbon footprint? You know, this is a great question. Obviously, individually, um, you know, one person's not going to get us to our big goals, but collectively, you better believe we are. And what I would say to people is, you know, start looking at electric vehicles. <laughs> I mean, I, I drive an electric vehicle. I plug it in in my garage. It's safe. I never have to go to the gas station. Once you start telling people that, if we are able to get incentives to bring down the initial point of sale uh, cost of electric vehicles so that they're on par with internal combustion engines, at least in this year, the technology is moving so fast with respect to batteries, which is the biggest uh, part of the cost, that it's uh, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance or those who are doing the analysis of these say that the um, internal combustion engine and the, um, uh, the new car sales that those electric vehicles will surpass uh, the internal combustion engine by 2030 because people save $600 a year just in not having to gas up and the maintenance is so much easier. I have solar panels that I lease on my, on my uh, garage and so I really just drive on sunshine. You're in the sunshine state. It would be a great, you could be a great spokesperson for, for this. So I think it's really important for people to know that they have their own role but ultimately that shouldn't negate the role of policy because that is really the big uh, right. driver of reducing our co2 emissions right and in in the uh president's plans in build back better i know look I, I do live in florida i have to live in a condominium where obviously i can't do anything about the roof but the garage there's no there's no place there's no electric sockets so and i'm sure that's there's a similar issue all over the country. Is there anything that's going to help us, you know, get get where we can use the the electric cars? Yeah, I know that the Department of Transportation is really looking at this because it is a big barrier. This question about multi-unit uh, dwellings and making sure we get the ability for people to just plug in where they live. Um, that's what the goal of getting these 500,000 charging stations is all about. Many of them for areas that. A lot of these um, private sector charge charging entities are not able to get into or or have found maybe aren't even um, uh, lucrative enough because it's just for one one person. So the I, I know that this is a great question, not to punt it over to um, to Secretary Buttigieg, but I know that they're working on a plan for that. And it's a big piece of the component of those 500,000 charging stations. That's good. And what do you say to folks who say, hey, look, we're you know, regardless of what we do here in the United States, uh, you know, let's look what's happening in China, other uh, places of the world. What difference is it going to make? Yeah, listen, it's going to make a huge difference. First of all, there is um, a lot of pressure publicly on China uh, for their build out of coal in their Belt and Road initiatives, for example. 
there is a the rest of the world and China has signed on to the Paris Agreement, so they have made public commitments to reduce their CO2 footprint. It absolutely makes a difference. But I will say this too, that since the rest of the world is moving in this direction, it's a huge market opportunity for the countries that actually build the products that reduce CO2 emissions and they build and build them in a way that those other countries can trust, whether it's trust from a cyber perspective or just uh, trust because the, you know, the mining of materials is done in a socially responsible way. So the U.S. can really jump in both on the economy and on reducing our own CO2 emissions and continue the drumbeat to uh, essentially shame uh, those who are not uh, fully on board, at least are on board with words, but not with actions. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Frankel. And if you're not speaking, please turn your mics off, folks. There was a little feedback there. So uh, thank you very much. Congressman Fleischman. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Ranking Member Simpson. Um, Madam Secretary, I've been taking some very meticulous notes. Uh, and I think uh, this has been a very uh, successful and furtive conversation. I thank you for that as, as well. A couple of things stand out to me, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, this subcommittee works very well together. As, as you've been able to engage in the discourse, you're, you're, you're hearing from Republicans and Democrats from all over, not only the political spectrum, but uh, from all over the country. And we're a subcommittee. And, and again, I, I thank uh, Chair, Chairwoman Kapker and Ranking Member Simpson for creating an environment where we can work together. So. Uh, we, we've seen that today. Uh, a couple of things that, that, are, that are standing out. Uh, of course, in Oak Ridge, we do quite a bit of work on, on fusion. Our commitment to ITER is strong, and I, I think you can see that there. But as we work, uh, there are uh, other folks in Congress uh, called authorizers. Okay, We are the appropriators. Um, we are working with them. They're good people, too. Uh, and I'm talking with them uh, about fusion. Uh, there, there seems to be a lot of, of interest there, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna work there with you. I did want to let you know that uh, I'm so thankful that Ms. Lee uh, from Nevada is going to be working with me on the Nuclear Cleanup Caucus. I've chaired that in the past, and uh, Congressman Lujan, before he became Senator Lujan, actually let me continue to chair that as we worked in the last administration. So. We'll be well versed. We're going to look at the science. We're going to work together. Uh, but there, there's, there are so many different resources out there. Not every issue, Madam Secretary, is political. Mr. Simpson is right. Yucca got bogged down in politics, and and it is gone now. And once it is gone, we've got to look for other solutions. So perhaps that'll free up the space, and we can work towards that. I did want to put a couple things on your radar before I ask another question. Uh, I've created the Nuclear Renaissance Caucus, um, but for the fact that I'm musically illiterate, I would be a new, I would be a, a Renaissance man. So I'll find my my scope there. We're uh, involving people on the new generation of reactors um, and technology, uh, and I would would say this: uh, the last administration to which credit created programs like the Atomic Wings Program where the secretary and, uh, had members of, of the House come there with other experts. So there can be a, a congruence of, of efforts with the administration and congressional caucuses, which tend to work together. So having said that, um, I, I look forward to working with you. I've got one last question, uh, very important. Um, for those on the subcommittee, uh, we no longer have a domestic source to enrich uranium in this country. And I think that is a shame. Um, I appreciate the administration's support of nuclear energy and the specialty nuclear fuel needed to power the next generation of reactors. I'm proud that in Oak Ridge, we have the sole American facility that manufactures uranium enrichment centrifuges, uh, which are currently being deployed for the department's high assay, low enriched uranium, HALU, uh, demonstration program. Do you support expanding Americans' HALU production capacity in fiscal 22 and beyond? And I'll, I'll just await your response. Yeah, I mean, clearly we need HALU. We need uh, enrichment capacity for both our national security programs and for the next generation of nuclear reactors. And I think at various times, both the NNSA and the Office of Nuclear Energy have 
have funded enrichment R&D. And I've asked both of those programs to take a look at see to see if there's any efficiencies to be gained from working in tandem to develop that next generation of uranium enrichment. Um, I do believe that a domestic source of uranium enrichment is important for the country. Um, but I'd like to work with our team further, and I'd love to introduce you, because you're in such an important district for this, uh, to Jill Ruby, who the president has um, nominated to be the NNSA uh, administrator, and, um, and to be able to talk with you about working uh, on this further. I really appreciate your, uh, your embrace of nonpartisanship and of the importance of this issue for the nation uh, and not just for a political party. I really um, look forward to working with you. People have told me how great you have been in, um, and I don't mean to say this just to, um, you know, to, uh, because we're in a hearing, et cetera, but because you have been apparently just enormously helpful in ensuring that the funding exists to be able to do the work that's necessary at Oak Ridge. So thank you for that. My pleasure, Madam Secretary. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Fleischman, uh, for your uh, very vigilant participation. Congressman Ryan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, I want to thank the gentleman from Tennessee because he, he teed up my question um, with regard to the HALU uh, issue, and we know that we're we're relying on Russia uh, primarily for the for the uh, you know commercial uranium and all of that. And um, the the town that I mentioned uh, in the last question with all the kids, they they have an opportunity here um, to develop. Uh, I think an opportunity to develop a lot of jobs down in, in Piketon, Ohio. Um, so. It's called Centrist. Uh, it, the work down there is being done right now by Centrist at the at, at the Piketon facility. Um, an opportunity to create um, a lot of jobs, and and so I would just uh, want to ask you to kind of look at what's going on down there. I mean, everything that you've said, and I've, I've listened to almost the entire hearing, and uh, extremely impressive your your range after just a few months uh, of all uh, understanding all of these issues. Um, but we know that nine out of the 10 companies that were awarded funds under the DOE's advanced reactor demonstration program uh, require HALU. Um, and so we want to say, hey, look, here in southern Ohio, uh, it's centrist in Piketon where we're having all of these other issues, I think is a great opportunity. So I wanted to uh, get that on your radar to just say, hey, look, the Department of, Department of Energy can have a, have a, a pretty nice uh, project here where it, it strikes all the balances of getting into these pockets that have been left behind, next generation, serving a bigger national purpose, supporting in some ways our defense industrial base. So uh, I'm glad the gentleman from Tennessee teed up an issue in Ohio, and that doesn't happen much, but we're working with Oak Ridge, as I mentioned in the last uh, round of questioning up in the Voltage Valley. And, and maybe there's a, a partnership again with, with Oak Ridge in, in Southern Ohio where we can work together on something like this. Great, great. Well, um, I know that you'll see progress on this HALU issue in the budget. And I really, I appreciate you putting that on my razor, radar with Centris. And I look forward to um, diving in a little bit more and working with you on it. I love the notion of, of a job opportunity in creating um, particularly material that we may get from Kazakhstan or elsewhere that is not as friendly. So let's continue to work together on it. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I know I know you mentioned, uh, I think earlier, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, blue hydrogen, um, which we know um, is can, can happen and works if it's using renewable energy. And so we have a reimagine uh, the Appalachian region project going on here in Ohio to build these big solar farms across the board and then, you know, tap into the, to the blue hydrogen uh, opportunities there. So I'm just excited to work with you because, you, you know, you're saying everything right. You've got a history of doing it in Michigan and uh, we have an opportunity now with you there and, and Ms. Captor, who's been advocating for this for a long, long time before it was cool, I will say, Marcy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is why First Solar's in Toledo and doing so well. So we look forward to working with you. Thank you. And we, we can do this in a bipartisan way as well. Appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Ryan. Uh, Congressman uh, 
Congressman Reschenthaler. Thanks, Chairwoman. I appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> Madam Secretary, I just wanted to pick up, if you don't mind, where we left off regarding uh, critical minerals. And uh, I know uh, I, I know the chair touched upon this, but could you elaborate on how uh, the Department of Energy will work to support the refining and processing of rare earth elements and, and improve smelting capabilities? <clears throat> this, this is the issue, right, is that we don't really have uh, much in the way of processing in the United States. And so what we want to do, I mean, what I'd love to see is a group of us working on a strategy that will build up the processing capacity in addition to the mining uh, capacity for the country, because there are obviously major jobs in both places. And you can do this in both things. I mean, both of these, both mining and processing have been seen as environmentally um, harmful in the past, but we have the, the ability to do both in a responsible way and to be able to secure these supply chains. So I think this is a, a question for further um, both appropriation, but also exploration in terms of strategy. Part of this, I think you'll see in the um, response to the Department of Defense's um, uh, critical mineral supply chain um, report that they have to do in response to the president's executive order. So let's let's stay in touch and follow up on this because I do think we we've got to move on it quickly. It's not something that can happen overnight, and it takes a while. So we've got to get going. Uh, I totally agree. And just to shift gears, I know that we were talking about the importance of uh, rare earth elements to national security, but I think that exporting liquefied natural gas is also important because. I think that when we export LNGs, we're helping, uh, we're, we're, first off, we're making sure other nations aren't, aren't dependent on China and, and Russia for it. We're also um, reducing global poverty. <clears throat> and, and I think we're actually improving the environment because natural gas burns a lot cleaner than other fuel sources. So what's the administration's position with respect to exporting LNG? Yeah, I mean, clearly the Natural Gas Act um, has um, direction for the Department of Energy on that, and I think the um, you know the the thing with LNG that's an, that's perhaps uh, something we should be looking at more is the removal of methane from the process, um, both at the point of extraction and in the pipeline and at the point of combustion as well, because methane obviously is so much more powerful than um, carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So I think we, we're interested in focusing on DOE. We're looking at a methane initiative to remove, remove uh, methane emissions from natural gas to begin with. I understand the importance of reducing CO2, particularly in countries where um, we may have an agreement to do that. But I also wanna just put on your radar that other countries have really expressed a great interest in hydrogen as well. And this is another area that we can help to export technology in with global partners who are very hungry to get dispatchable, reliable baseload power, which of course is what they want when they, um, when they obtain liquefied natural gas. So both, both things have to happen. We have to work on the methane emissions, but also work on technologies like hydrogen that produce no CO2. Right. right. Hey, uh, uh, Madam Secretary, I, I sincerely and genuinely mean this, and I look forward to working with you and Great. wish you the best in the new position. And uh, with that, I would yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you, Chairwoman. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Congressman Russian I wish we could figure out a way to send some of the LNG through this Great Lake St. Lawrence Seaway to Ukraine, but I can't convince the military leaders that that's a good idea. So uh, anyway, I'm with you on that. <laughs> um, so... Uh, uh, I what? Oops! What happened there? Um, I don't know if the secretary can hear me. Can I you can hear, hear me? You. I can hear you. Okay, great, great. Um, I um, wanted to uh, just touch on uh, the NNSA weapons activities, and uh, we know that the nuclear weapons complex is at capacity uh, from both a workforce and a manufacturing perspective. And we've heard this from past NSA administrators and even heard from the current head of STRATCOM that NSA can only absorb so much work at one time. So my question really is, while we don't yet know what is included in the FY22 budget request for NNSA, we do know that current workload and pace of NNSA is unsustainable. 
I want to work with you to rebalance this risky and unrealistic situation while meeting defense needs. Madam Secretary, will you commit to working with me on these efforts? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You're totally right that this work is is critical. we got to get it right. I stand uh, ready to work with you. I, I just want to say I can assure you that the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy through the NNS, uh, through the Nuclear Weapons uh, Council, we are uh, constantly evaluating requirements and workload and risks and the president's uh, 22 budget will support the current defense requirements while this administration conducts uh, a review. All right. Thank you very much. I want to move quickly to the issue of workforce development. And of course, we're living through an era of disruptive technologies. This has happened before. Uh, but we know that in the area of energy, as you've referenced, the median hourly wage for energy workers in our country is uh, approximately $25.60 an hour, a third higher than the national median hourly wage of $19.14. So that's good news for the energy sector. What role do you believe the Department of Energy should have in helping train the next generation of skilled workers to take advantage of these tremendous opportunities? And how can the department uh, build from its existing workforce programs to better coordinate efforts throughout the department and with other federal agencies. Is there a plan in place to do that? Back to your question about coordination um, and, and working with, for example, the Department of Labor. Uh, as you're aware, in the, Amer in the American Jobs Plan that the president has put forward, it's $100 million for, for training and workforce development, including uh, big uh, support for apprenticeships, which are very important. The, um, you know, the, the jobs that are coming out of the American Jobs Plan, the vast majority of them don't even don't require anything beyond a high school degree. And so um, that means they're accessible. And the question is, can you provide the hands on um, place based uh, training that is necessary? Um, you know, this, the workforce pipeline is also critical. You know this from your uh, long standing leadership in this workforce development area. And so, you know, we want to make solar jobs more accessible to diverse uh, communities. We want to make geothermal jobs accessible to like oil and gas workers. We need a pipeline of diverse workers in STEM fields. We need to make sure that we train them all. So I think you're going to see, because this president um, is so, is really focused on execution and execution well, which we've seen in the um, distribution of the vaccine. This issue of the American Jobs Plan and making sure that it is executed correctly, that the departments are speaking to one another, that there's effectiveness and measurable accountability on each, I think will be a very important part of uh, assuming that we get it across the finish line. I wanted to just give an insight. I was speaking with the Secretary of Education about a week ago because I represent my hometown actually, has no community college. I won't go into all the reasons, but it's been terrible uh, for minorities, uh, for people who are financially pressed to get an education because they can't afford to drive to the nearest community college. And I was looking for solutions. And he actually told me that his first degree was in auto mechanics at the high school level. And that he went on, he says, because people didn't think that I could succeed. So I was, uh, you know, asked to go into this field. He said he excelled. And I said, what, uh, uh, solutions do you have for me? He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, um, I think you should work more closely with your high schools in the late sophomore, beginning of the junior year and do your education through the internet and get college credit for it. And with the new administration's focus on community colleges, I would urge you to think about the internet and ways in which DOE genius could help to identify some of these fields where we're short on people and work with the Secretary of Education because I found him very practical and having lived the experience, he understands it. And for the trade schools that exist across our region, so often they're suburbanized. And I don't know if that's true in Michigan and in Idaho and other places, but um, they're inaccessible to uh, the majority of our uh, minority communities. And we simply have to educate in these fields. We have to find a way to use technology to reach forgotten places. And uh, so I just I just mentioned that to you because um, uh, we have a major task to uh, help the DOE build uh, forward from its existing workforce programs to better coordinate, not just with your own department, but with others. So uh, I wanted to, to point that out. I know my time is up for this round and I will go to Congressman Simpson. 
I don't have any questions for a third round, uh, Madam Secretary. I just wanted to thank the Secretary for uh, being here today. And you've been at this for about three hours now. I suspect you're you're ready for lunch or something, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. And, you know, our, one of our jobs is to make sure that you're successful in your job. So uh, oh, look forward so nice. uh, to doing whatever we can to make that happen. Thank that you. is so nice. Thank you so much. And and one of my jobs is to make sure you're successful too. So let's do that together. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, Madam Secretary, I think that uh, I would echo Congressman Simpson's uh, remarks. You've just been a superb uh, witness. We're so proud of you and so proud of what you're doing. My own view of the Department of Energy is it's one of the most brilliant but humble places that exist in the world. And uh, if there's any way you can draw forward from the bowels of that enterprise, uh, a way of speaking to the American people about the future, you are the person that can do it. And uh, we look at the retirements that are likely to occur in the near future and the shortage of top level scientists. There's simply, ha I tried to get the past uh, secretaries to create. I'm old enough. I don't know if you are. There used to be a Mr. Wizard on TV. Of course. And students would use him and it was exciting. Nobody at the department volunteered. I said, find me the person that I can show, you know, uh, put, put on our uh, social media, put on uh, the media of our science uh, and um, uh, engineering uh, museums around the country. Uh, five, well, they never could do it. And, you know, so you've got these brilliant people that can't meet the street, and yet they're begging us for individuals to apply. So there's something really missing. I think when you have a very, very fine, fine uh, right brain, you can't meet the left brain. There's something that doesn't happen. And um, I think members of Congress tend to have half and half. They can do both. Uh, as a former governor, you've probably got a double set up there. But but I just I just say that um, uh, this is really needed in our country, and we're not linking well to encourage people to move into these fields. So whoever the public relations staff is over there, please, uh, maybe the department with the amount of money that's going to be spent can find a way to create the artwork. You did it today in your presentation. There was some effort by the department put forward to visualize what you're doing. That is so needed. Uh, if we're going to meet the test, the department must learn to communicate. And, uh, and it is a big need. So I will just end with that and thank you. And as uh, our fine ranking member did, you are always welcome uh, before this subcommittee. We look forward to working with you uh, to helping our country move forward faster. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with you too. All right. Thank you. And thank you to all who made this uh, particular hearing possible, to Jamie Scheimek, Matt Kaplan, uh, Scott, the entire staff, Will, who's been handling the communication, Sue Rowe of my own staff. Thank you all very, very much.